Hello, listeners and readers of AwardsWatch.com. This is the Awards Watch Podcast, episode 208. Last week I screwed up and I said it was 208, and that was actually 207, so this is actually 208. I am your executive editor, Ryan McQuay. Joining me today is our associate editor, Sophia Simonello. The cool girl of Awards Watch is here. <laughs> and our uh, Awards Watch staff writer, Jay Ledbetter. I didn't get that ink for nothing today. You can call me the boy with the dragon tattoo. Oh, for God's sake. All right. <laughs> you have your glasses hanging on the edge of your face. Yeah, right hold on. Now? Yeah. As like Daniel Craig does in the dragon tattoo movie. It's Jay? a very normal way to wear glasses. Me and Daniel have talked about it. We, we do it all the time. Just It's just hanging on by his chin. Yeah. Today, we are here to talk about dragon tattoos and cool girls and uh, killers and the process. Because we're here to talk about David Fincher's The Killer, which is streaming on Netflix. But we're also here to talk about our top five David Fincher movies. I'm super excited. Uh, Jay and I have talked about every one of David Fincher's films. So it only feels right to talk about The Killer and have him on. And I know uh, Sophia and I were able to see The Killer earlier this year at AFI. We said on the AFI show that we would save our thoughts for this episode. Not everybody's been able to see it um i don't we won't know the numbers because of course it's netflix and so we won't know exactly how well it's doing but it's on the main page at least and and uh they're promoting it it seems like which is good i mean it's a it's a david fincher film for christ's sake we're not we don't get many of these every single year because we get them every three to four years but i don't know how are you guys doing uh this week everybody doing okay ready for some fincher talk ready for some venture talk i watched the killer again today and happy to say that netflix understands my algorithm because my poster was of tilda swinton it wasn't of michael fassbender oh, wow. so it mm. knows me That's right. special all right i want to pose this question right up at the top before we talk about the killer because this is a question that sophia had in our text thread between the three of us and it was a conversation that she had with her dad it's actually a conversation that we've had a lot between myself and Jay and Sophia. This hesitance to call David Fincher one of our guys. Maybe it's not cool online. Maybe people, because they dog on it all the time about certain, you know, film Twitter, film bro directors. I mean, but it's because of Fight Club. I, it's totally I because so. of Fight Club. Yeah. But I mean, guys, he is one of our guys, right? There's, there's just no question about that, right? Right, Jay? I don't I don't like him <laughs> and and we're, we're going to talk about it a lot today, but he's, you know, I mean, what do the kids say these days? Mid? Is that what we kind of call Fincher? <laughs> the kids say these days? Yeah, that's what the kids are saying. Okay. No, be for real. I know. I Jay, I know no, he's a, how much you is, love this him. is this is a conversation we have had before. I think all three of us have had before is why am I so reticent to, to call him one of my favorite? If, if I just go through movie by movie. And I'm looking at my letterbox scores. It's like four and a half, five, five, four and a half, five, five, two and a half. Whoops. Five, four and a half, five, five. I mean, it's it's the consistency with him is is crazy. And but there is that little stigma where you're like, well, you know, like people who don't like movies the way I like movies like David Fincher. So I, I shouldn't like him, you know, as much. Which is just stupid and pretentious. And it just if it's actually kind of awesome that you can have somebody who doesn't think about movies the way that we think about movies, but we'll watch Zodiac, which is so different than the traditional kind of thriller. And they're like, yeah, that movie absolutely rules. And we might think it rules for totally different reasons, but I get why you love it. You understand why I love it. And it's it, it, Fincher's the great unifier. He's yeah. the great unifier. It's why he keeps getting these big budgets. That's what I think. Um, he, he's making too. high art out of low material sometimes, which is what makes him so cool. Yeah. Sophia? Yeah. I mean, it's, it is interesting. Yeah. The, the conversation that I had with my dad, you know, where he called me out on like, being <laughs> too proud to call Fincher one of my favorite directors, which is very funny, especially because the one of the reasons why I think, you know, I, I can say, confidently that Fincher is one of my favorite directors is because when I wow. was growing up, my 
and there is a fight club problem, which we could all, I'll get to in a minute, but yeah. growing up, I mean, my dad introduced me to so many Fincher movies when I was young and they, and as I was like going to college and getting older and starting to figure out what type of films I really loved, I started to really connect with his movies and think of him really as our modern Hitchcock. He really is kind of the perfect director, I think, for for me and my interests when I think about it too. Like I love how he plays with realism, these odes to film noir. He is the master of creating and relieving tension. And I'm just so fascinated by all of the choices that he's made throughout his filmography. And when you watch a Fincher film, you know that it's his. The lighting is so pleasing to me. I love the eerie feeling that he creates, like there's something looming out there that we need to fear. But he's, his movies are also very funny, a lot of them, even in their darkness. And that's something that I have always really responded to. But yeah, I mean, too proud to call him one of my favorites, hesitant to. I think a lot of that does stem from like going to college when I did and seeing the Fight Club posters and dorm rooms and, you know, seeing that and hearing how people would talk about Fincher, specifically how guys would talk about Fight Club and its importance. I, it just kind of, I don't know, it's just gross, honestly. But that's not actually, like, that's not a good way to look at a filmmaker and to look at his filmography. Because when I actually sit down and think about his films and what I love, it's the same thing that Jay said. I'm like, oh, five stars, four and a half. Like, all of the movies that we'll talk about today when we get to my top five are five and four and a half star movies for me and not a lot of directors can do that so yeah i love fincher i'm coming out today and saying it he is one of my favorites wow. please clap important yeah. Yeah. let's do it Slow clap. let's do a round of applause <laughs> we can all agree though tyler durden is someone to admire and look up to correct no uh we can right. we, yeah. yeah no but i do not. i do love how brad pitt looks in that movie i will have to good. say that <sighs> good lord and um, i i do want to say too that david fincher this is my little my sweet story about david fincher he is the genesis for my podcast oscar wilde because i met my friend and co-host nick over 10 years ago now and the first thing that we bonded over was our love for david venture well there you go I'm there here. you go and um i i i for me i think i'm the same way with you guys i think that fight club is this movie that is really like i think the 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 taxi driver of our generation in terms of people have attached themselves to it and i think that taken all these different avenues of how they interpret it. And I think that they've interpreted it in very um, misunderstood and dangerous kind of ways. And, and it's then put this imprint on how you perceive maybe the films of an artist that has made really just some of the most fascinating films of the last 30 years and some of the most entertaining, some of the most, like you're saying, Jay, He's able to reach across, I think, with the average film goer, but then also keep the art house audience very much mm -hmm. entertained and in, and engaged. And his movies are very thought provoking. I think he's also <laughs> Jay and I did a a, a, a a film series years ago um, over his films, and he's like the king of schlock. Like he loves these these airport novels that nobody else can touch Elevated and pulp exactly so good at that so Love good at that it about him. Mm -hmm. sophia you mentioned his humor he is it, he is a lot like i think paul thomas anderson in that he's super darkly comedic a sardonic and, wit exactly and he's also just this <laughs> this ultra uh just fixated person hundreds of takes uh, you know, making sure that this this coffee mug is pointed in the right direction because of why? Because it is in its head, and it, and it, and otherwise, you know, I I think back to the the well, story. Now, he can, now he'll just fix it digitally. Yeah, now he's just fix it digitally, and that's <laughs> the other thing too. He's the king of digital photography, the digital filmmaking. He's the one person that if you want to make the argument of like, well, digital cinema is great or good um and if and they were like no you you got to preserve it this way it's like well david fincher makes some of the most beautiful films <laughs> consistently mm -hmm. every single time you're watching them and they age for the most part pretty damn well and 
He has some of the best director commentaries you'll ever have. He has great interviews when he wants to interview, but he's also fascinating guy. It's just a fascinating, best fascinating guy. Steven Soderbergh. Yeah. What a life. I mean, I, I, I loved during the, the Mank um, award season run, he had a conversation I, and it was actually my first thing I watched this week. Uh, and I told Sophia about it, of that I watched the conversation between him and Ben Affleck. And just, you would think of this guy, he has this, it is, I think, the Fight Club, this, this seriousness or this, this you know, because you hear of the, the hundreds and hundreds of takes, he's laughing that entire time. He is a very bubbly guy. I think of him as the guy during, when he's at the Golden Globes on a Zoom, taking shots every time he loses a Golden Globe. Like, he's, <laughs> there's, there's nobody like him. And he's made... He's made sort of his transition to digital streaming, and he's essentially going to be with Netflix probably for the remainder of his career, you at least. It right on the head. Netflix has the greatest quality control in the business. Quote <laughs> David Fincher. <laughs> well, I mean, insane things anyone has ever said. Well, he is the he reason. Keeps us on our toes. He's the reason why they have essentially the platform they have in the and the, and gave them the legitimacy. Whether you think that's House good or cards. not, House of Cards putting, you know, directing those episodes, and then he's made Mank and The Killer and Manhunter. So he he is, and he thinks that it's the future, and he's okay to say that, and and that's his opinion. You know what I mean? Just like other people would say, it's the death of it. You know what I mean? And so, um, and he's also always thinking towards the next thing and not and not shying away from it. If the industry says this is going to go. Well, I'm going to embrace it and do it my way. And my way will probably be the best version of that way, you know? So I, I, I think he is, yeah, he's one of the most fascinating filmmakers we have going today without question. And yeah, he's one of my guys. Like I love all these movies. He's the thing one about of one of my guys, when we did mm-hmm. the, t- when we're doing the top five today, there's like two or three movies outside of this list that I'm, that, that aren't in my five. I'm sitting, I'm like, how the hell can we make it a top eight today? How can we make it a, can we do a top, like, you know, and and we would just rank them all, but um, we would be here for the best four hours. Eights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. His top eight are like legitimately great movies. So, and one of those, even the ones I didn't pick. Yeah. Like even those that I love so much that I didn't pick, I was like, Oh, well it's fine because I know that Jay or Ryan will take them and then we can talk about them as a group. So See, I think we're going to have a crazy amount of crossover on our Yeah, we'll I think see. so. We'll yeah, see. I think so. At least three for yeah, sure. I think so. Yeah. I think, I think, I think my list will cross over with all five on at least one of y'all's list. I'm going to put that out there today. So wow. I don't know. I'm going to say that. Um, not like in the same spot, but there will be this exact five. Film. Okay. We will be talking um, about all of your movies twice. Exactly. Well, we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about the top five and the structure that here in a second. But Jay, I know that you recently this week you saw the killer, so you you have it fresh on your mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, David Fincher's new film starring Michael Fassbender, Tilda Swinton, um, and it premiered this week on Netflix. You got to see it in a theater at least. Um, I did. You know about a after a faithful near miss and assassin battles his employers and himself. On an international manhunt, he insists isn't personal. Uh, it's based off of a graphic novel, right? That Fincher right. has, um, which is really interesting because you know it's not a big comic book, but it's still Fincher doing a going into that realm, which is something that he's been okay with, like we said with the Dime Store novels. Um, hour and four, uh, a two-hour, just solid noir-inspired revenge flick. Jay, what did you what you love about it? First of all, shout out to me. I saw this <laughs> on Thursday night. I could have waited until the next day when it was going to go on streaming, but I supported the cinematic arts. Shout and out to you. You wanted to give it just important. a yeah. shout out to yourself. Huge okay. credit to me mm-hmm. uh, for for doing that and uh, tr- trying to keep uh, movie theaters alive. But this this was certainly one of my most anticipated movies of the year. I mean, you 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 give me fin sure automatically we're i'm looking forward to it beyond compare just about but fassbender if you had asked me 10 ish years ago who do you think is the next great 
actor. I would have said Fastbender. Were you? Would you be buying stock into the? You were buying big stock, right? On the Fastbender. I've lost. I've lost a lot of money on Fastbender stuff. (laughs) Let me let me put it that way, because the guy loves racing cars. I guess. Yeah. But um, but it was it was so cool to kind of have this opportunity to to see him come back and for him to do it in a Fincher movie. He seems like a perfect match for Fincher because of his philic physicality he's such a kind of a stoic performer his he's got so much presence and that presence is totally required for this film because it is outside of narration uh a pretty wordless role he has in this film and this movie I will say this it is nothing like what I expected it to be I was expecting something kind of more straightforward and accessible I think this movie is going to put off general audiences in ways that I kind of thought Fincher was like, I want to go back to kind of crowd pleasing after Mank, which was Mm -hmm. a very niche kind of specific movie. But what he's done here is kind of made almost an anti thriller. That's about the mundane lonely existence of this assassin in a bucket hat who just waxes <laughs> philosophical about everything around him. Some of it, I think, is meant to be taken as quasi-thoughtful, and then some of it, I really think, is almost Fincher being like, yeah, I kind of messed up when I made everybody think Tyler Durden was a super deep dude. Like, when early in the film, the moment where it clicked for me was when, in the first scene, he's talking about, like, you know, it could be really hard being an assassin, all this blah, 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 blah. And he's like, I think Popeye said it best. I am what I am. And it's said in this totally like po-faced seriousness. And I was just like, okay, all right, we're on, we're on a unique Fincher satirical um, bend with this movie. So um, I think it's really good. It has a lot more on its mind than you might think on the surface. But and I'm, and I'm sure we'll get to all of that. But I was super impressed by it. It was totally not what I was expecting, but I I loved it. I, I can't wait to talk about it. Yeah, Sophia, I think you've seen. You said that you saw it again today. I think that was what like your third, fourth My time. My third time. Yeah. Yeah. So I watched it for the first time opening weekend at New York Film Festival when they did the special screenings there, mm-hmm. and then I saw it again, and I think what was the best possible screening of the film at the Academy Museum with the Fincher Q and a afterwards and there were members of the crew there, but seeing it in that theater and hearing the sound work was just, I mean, one of the best theatrical experiences that I've had all year. I think this movie is insanely funny. I, cannot stop laughing when i watch it and it gets funnier even on rewatch <laughs> when you know what's coming and you can settle into the rhythm of the movie because it is strange on first watch it almost doesn't feel like jay like you were saying like the sort of fincher film that you're expecting because so much of it is this very dry monotone voiceover from fastbender and then mm. the humor is just dry as a bone which is the the best part of it for me um but then i think again on rewatch and even at home it does work at home i'm happy to report um on rewatch you start thinking more deeply about those themes that are simmering underneath that might seem like jokes at first or and they are but you start thinking about okay like more i was thinking a lot about casino actually on this watch and kind of that like middle management settling into a job that you could be good at, but you're maybe not that good at and you can't really go anywhere. So you're trying to figure out what that life is like for you. Um, it's a very, very violent, has a lot, a lot of great detail about corporate America in it and brands. A lot of brands. And yep. I think that it's really just an, it's such a fun time that Fincher is having poking fun at himself. Yeah. I mean, it's the first time Fincher's worked with, um, his seven screenwriter, Andrew Kevin Walker, mm-hmm. um, first time in a while. And yeah, I agree. I think it's like one of the comedies of the year. Um, it's just, he's it's like tapped. a send up of seven. It yeah. is yeah. crazy that it's the same guy. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, you know, it starts off for the first 15 minutes. Like you're mentioning Jay, just a guy sitting there listening to the Smiths, 
doing yoga, going to McDonald's. It's just all about you know, like typical, you know, typical Fincher stuff, all about the process, all about the, you know, how this guy is just sitting there waiting. And of course you get this just very monotone, but just cold dialogue that's being done by Michael Fassbender. And the longer it's going, the funnier on the rewatch, I think it is because it, it is just showcasing how this job is so mundane, like you're mentioning, and just so tiresome and like that the music has to balance out the silence that's around you, the loneliness of a job like this. Like in most movies, this whole thing is like the cool set piece that would drive the film going forward and yeah. propel us all these different locations and Fincher and, and, and Walker are just like, no, this fucking sucks. Like, like to do a job like this is terrible. Like nobody wants to do this. And especially if they screw up because then there's so many consequences. And I saw it at the Milberg film festival for the first time. And I was, I, I, I agree with you, Sophia. Like it, it, I had to kind of take it all in because right from the beginning, like from the Netflix logo, you're thrown into just classic Fincher um, of those, just the, the opening title cards are so, uh, you know, they're just so cool and the very dra- dragon tattoo esque. They are mm-hmm. not, they are from a different movie. I will yes. tell you that. Yeah. They are like, they are like from almost <laughs> like a Soderbergh movie. It feels like it felt very haywire when I was, when I was watching, when I was watching, I was like, Oh, like this is going to be like really fun. And like, you know, kind of mm-hmm. just like globe trying and, like, and, yeah. and then it starts and it you're like, slows down. Nope. Yeah. And it's like, Nope, mm-hmm. we're not doing, we're in Paris and none just of that. Sh- like we're not going to fancy restaurants. We're not, we're not going, you know, we're not <laughs> meeting up with, you know, it's not a John wick movie for Christ's sake. Mm-mm. This is, this is a David Fincher movie. You have to remember that. So it's going to go at your, his own pace. And I love that. And I think the second go around, which I saw with Sophia at the Academy Museum alongside with Eric, uh, I just was, we were laughing the whole time. We were having a ball with this. And oh God, the sound so design, fun. she mentioned it, the sound design of this movie from that beginning, I mean, of incorporating the, the Smith songs, but then cutting back through his perspective and what you would hear in his head, but then also what you're hearing on the outside as well. It's done throughout most of the film. I think the editing in this movie is absolutely extraordinary. No one's talking about that. Just uh, the the quip uh, lapses of time that Fincher and his team are just able to do. Once again, like the most meticulous filmmaker out there on the planet making a movie about a job that you need to be very meticulous at. And I think that that's really interesting. Is there meta commentaries to be made about his previous work? His last film, I think there is. Sophia kind of brought one up. I would like you to talk about that here in a little bit. but of course. um, Because I think that that's fascinating because on the third watch, I was thinking about all that because (laughs) it's a movie that for audiences, they can see on the surface just everything that's in front of them. It's a good little revenge film. But if you're Fincher heads like we are and love this man's work and know that these movies aren't exactly just all here on the surface every movie that we're going to talk about here later in his top five there's all these layers to the onion that he is crafting and he's so much smarter than just these other directors that try to make a movie like this and he makes and that's what makes him so special so i and i think fast spenders i mean don't make movies with taika waititi make movies with david fincher please fast is awesome you know he's so good in this movie good in this yeah and so is Tilda Swinton. I love the way that he. I love the way that Fassbender moves in this movie. Like not just during, doing yes. his yoga, which is incredible. Like I do not the way know he walks. how body bends in that way, but the way he walks through the streets, it sort of reminded me of Kevin Spacey's John Doe. Like there's just like a way that he sort of rolls as he walks that is so unsettling. Where I'm like, you do not actually look like a real human when you're you're moving through the streets, except he blends right in and that's his goal right to look like a german tourist so that no one will bother him i love that he doesn't blink he never blinks yeah. in this movie at all and i love the way he eats his mcdonald's oh and he's God. sitting there eating his food for fuel just taking the looking like an bread absolute off of psychopath it, looking like a psychopath as he's like watching the city wake up 
Oh my god, hysterical! I mean, look, my favorite is la- dollar my, for mm. dollar. That's the most efficient protein <laughs> carb meal you can have. <laughs> Popping I, yeah. the egg in his mouth. Yes, when he's that is the he's, funniest though. Yeah, the egg is the whole hard boiled <laughs> egg. Is it's like that is a moment. I can't wait for that gif jif however we're going to say it but yeah um yeah no i mean and then i think it's got a scene of the year contender for me which is the dinner sequence mm-hmm. between him and tilda uh, swinton yeah it's cool. got i think maybe the best action set piece of the year between the this sort of comic book style fastly chaotic edited fight sequence between him and the guy in florida which it's is got- basically but the thing about that scene is it could be John Wick. Dave yeah. Fincher is fully capable of making a scene with the intense choreography and specificity of a John Wick scene. But I think it is purposefully low lit. So yeah. it's not as glamorous as that. And also that whole scene, almost every scene in this movie is basically Michael Fassbender being like, you are in control. Do not think twice about anything <laughs> you're doing. And then he basically slips on a banana peel anytime he enters the room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's and so he's, funny. He's like, don't improvise. And then it feels like it's an entire improvisation. Well, yeah. but that's, that's why in that scene, it's so funny. And one of my favorite parts of that scene is it is so physical. It's so violent between these two. And then when he picks up that cheese grater and you think for a moment, like, oh, this is going to be his weapon. He's going to use this cheese grater, and but just, then he throws so it to funny. the side. And it actually, it's not like he's doing that on purpose. At least that's not how I read it. He doesn't want to use it, but it throws off the other guy. Yeah. So it's like he kind of lucks into all of these these situations in a way. Like you said, oh, he slips on a banana peel or he, like, that's the the feeling that you get. Like, he doesn't know how to, how much to give that dog to make it go to right. sleep. <laughs> like, all of these little details. I love. Well, and then he's, he throws, like, he has to throw three of them because the dog doesn't get it on the first two <laughs> yeah. go go attempts. And it's, yeah, it's, it's great. Mm-hmm. It's so silly. I mean, and then his, I mean, you have, obviously, the use of, like, the Smiths throughout the entire bit, which is just such a perfect soundtrack you could have to this movie. I think also of the aliases, these classic, um, uh, old sitcom television Mm -hmm. character names being used throughout and if if you don't know then you don't know and it's 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 trying to be of a different era but then it's also you you have you have even some of like some of the people there behind these counters or at at the you know at hotels or at the airports just kind of be like hmm that's your name huh um it's not it's not as uh it's he's not he's good at his job but it's not as good as you would want to assume and so it also makes you believe that he would miss and that he would have it's it's you know the movie was almost always billed as like this this guy is battling his internal demons and it's like no he's just kind of like maybe a b plus guy at this like he's pretty good but he's not like he's not like a a plus material is kind of like more of a b plus material which is kind of just interesting because Every time you watch a movie like this, these guys, like they're John Wick. They're like shooting everybody in the head precisely. Every bullet. You know what I mean? It's like those movies, you know, that's not interesting. Like having, um, having, yes, an unstoppable force is interesting, but also having flaws within that process too is, is really fascinating within himself. And then, I mean, you know, Fitch was always talking about himself in these movies. Um, I, I think that, I don't know. At least for How me, when I was watching, how much of a meta watching, commentary is this on him? I don't, I don't know. I was thinking think a little. I think it was a little bit. I think a, a little bit of it's in there. I think that it's. It felt like in the Q and A that we saw uh, Sophia and everything. It didn't feel like the normal Fincher, at least, where he didn't feel like so yeah. meticulous, very loose, very yeah. loose. You know what I mean? I, so see, I feel like so I think it does feel like a meta commentary, but not in a serious way, more mm-hmm. in a playful way. Like yeah. I don't think that's the overall goal of the film, but I do yeah. think that it's, there, though. it's funny to see Fincher make a movie like this after a movie like Mank. Yeah. Because what I started thinking of is, you know, if you if you equate that first scene to him making Mank, it's like what happens when you miss the mark? What do you do next? 
Like that's something that you, you want to think about. And that's always interesting to think about kind of like what you were just saying, Ryan earlier of like, what happens when you are like suddenly like a B plus talent, or you realize that, or you think that people might think that about you, how does that make you act differently necessarily? And I think that's kind of a funny thing to think about, but again, I also see it in more of the ways that like the tagline of the movie being execution is everything. Like, yes, that applies to assassins, but it also applies to directors and people who are really good at their jobs, people who are, you know, very, very precise. And Fincher has a reputation as one of the most like precise, controlled and controlling filmmakers around. Like when you watch the director's commentaries or you hear these stories, that's what people think of him. And he knows that. And I think he's, he's becoming like not more aware of that and a thing that like, this is my reputation, but in a way of like, in a, again, like a playful way, a fun way. And this is him, I think putting himself into it a little bit, but it's not, you know, it's not the Fablemans. It's not his origin story or anything like that. <laughs> Fincher's the Fablemans. I would love to see that. <laughs> well, it's so, Michael it's so f- as Sammy Fableman. Yeah. I mean, that sounds good. Let's be honest, but <laughs> it's, it's, I, I totally do see a certain amount of that. Um, meta commentary in this where it is the most controlling director around of his era talking about the fallacy of control Mm -hmm. Uh, i mean i I think that's kind of that might be a little bit of where it begins and ends for me some people are really seeing this as this is him laying out his entire method and his entire perception of his existence within this space which i don't think i really agree with no i think i think, think that's too playful fun to, to be have that, that read yeah. i think it's too yeah. fun to be that i think yeah. the i think the more meta commentary film is something more i think along the lines of mank than it is and talking about his career and talking about the hollywood system and things that he's kind of gone through what his father's gone through like i think that that's that's more of that like i think i do agree with you sophia like his process is definitely the thing that maybe he is talking about the most here, but I'm with Jay. I don't think it goes crazy deep. You know what I mean? Because it's, you know, maybe, you know, like you're saying, it's a, it's what do you do when you've made maybe a movie that not everybody loved or what do you do if you didn't hit the mark, right? Do you go back and how do you go back to that? Well, you do it in a way that you've never done it before, but that it's also comfortable for you, but it's also still scary. Um, You know, there there's that, but it's not like, that's not deep. That's not something you can write. I think in a, a mm-hmm. giant article about yeah. like I saw a lot with when Mank came out about just, you know, how everything mm-hmm. has kind of culminated up to this point for his entire career and the alien three stuff and everything that he's still very bitter about and yeah. and all that stuff. I but, think the more interesting thing too, that he's doing, which isn't a meta commentary, but it's more of like a way to revisit topics that he's addressed previously. I mean, Like we were saying at the top of the episode, he is the filmmaker, one of the filmmakers who can sort of reach across the aisle, like think of like commercial audiences, your typical moviegoer and the art house audience or the critic. The dumbest dumbest guy in the room and the smartest guy in the room. Yeah. And he's always also he's been known as someone who has been tied to, you know, commercials, to music videos, to these different types of filmmaking and art. And I think my favorite or one of my favorite things that this movie does is how he incorporates like capitalism, his ideas of capitalism and his place in that. And this character's place in that with all of these hilarious uses of 21st century brands. I mean, the fact that this movie starts in an abandoned WeWork, like he's going to a WeWork to carry out his hit is amazing. I mean, it is, it really is. If you want to talk about what is one of the things that David Fincher is saying about the world with this movie, it's that the only people who could really love the state of branding in 2023 are psychopaths. Um, Yeah. (laughs) And it's, it's so funny when you see that these, he's, he's basically using these mega corporations, uh, these things that exist in the world are supposed to make our lives quote unquote easier. They're assets for him to carry out hits, which yeah. is very funny. And it, it, it's, you know, tongue firmly planted in cheek uh, with, with Fincher in that regard. But it is so funny. Anytime you see a brand logo, you know, there's about to be a good joke. 
Um, <laughs> it's 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 so funny. And I do want to just circle back a little bit to Fastbender. I want to give Fastbender credit for being so I guess he just doesn't really care that much anymore because he's so unprecious about his persona mm-hmm. in this movie. Yeah. He's so unconcerned with becoming a giant movie star again. You see this film and the movie that I thought about when I was like, okay, what is this going to, is this going to be like his drive was my thought about this film. Is it going to be like this Uber slick movie star showcase? It is the exact opposite of that. It is clumsy and it is all about being as subdued as any movie star ever has been in a movie. Um, So just credit to Fassbender. I, I love him. I hope he's in more stuff. I don't know how the racing is going, um, but come back. You're not following him? Movies too. Race car movies. You're not following him on the, on the, on the, no, uh, I don't watch uh, drive to survive, oh. which I assume is the show he's on. I don't know. It's the only <laughs> racing thing I know about. <laughs> um, Yeah. I think he's pretty incredible in this movie. It, do we have yeah. any other thoughts that we have? I know we got like a top five to do here and everything, but, uh, is there any last things you guys want to? I got plenty of thoughts. Oh well, go Jay. Yeah. Well, no, now now that you're telling me to to wrap up now, I'm, I'm well, I'm, I'm blanking here, but <laughs> not so to tease, is... but maybe I can have some more thoughts on this when we get to my top five for oh, last minute well, edition. Well, well, yeah. Okay, um, well, you can hold that over. Um, well, Sophia, I know you're a big fan of the Smiths. Oh yeah. Did you have mm-hmm. a favorite? needle drop in in the film so it's just it's so funny because it is so embarrassing i think to love the smiths that's exactly it the smiths were tyler durden before tyler durden yeah that's what's so funny about it that's what's so funny about it it's like they're the most like moody like serious band i want to be a serious band like who morrissey is like it's just i don't don't listen to madonna i'm deep i listen to the smiths (laughs) (laughs) but yeah i i I love the needle drops i mean i think that the how soon is now moment is i mean it really is just incredible when i realized that that was the song he was going to um theoretically carry out this hit to it's just it's perfect and again the way that the sound team here works with the sound you hear it as non-diegetic and diegetic sound i've never really seen that in a movie before at least i can't think of the way that you hear it through his perspective and then it'll it'll be muffled and then you'll hear the full song and i remember like several times during this movie because i love the smiths catching myself wanting to hear (laughs) the full song as it was and being really i think pulled in and pulled out of the way that the sound and the songs are being used in the movie i think it's just it's really brilliant it's a movie Um, that refuses to satisfy it mm -hmm. just will not give you that that's what i love about it yeah. I love, that's what I love. Yeah. Um, but I was going to ask you guys, um, if you were an assassin, which band would you kill to? What would your playlist be? Oh. If you only had one artist. Because he only likes one artist. That's it. That's It's all the Smiths. That's true. Um, I would say Flo Rida. Oh, for God's sake. Well, I was going to, I was giving you like an easy acon i know well see, i thought about that but i was trying to subvert expectations you gotta, okay. yeah like david fitcher's 2023 do. film the killer <laughs> <laughs> if i was an assassin what would the soundtrack of my murdering be That's i mean a great question it's it it is a great question i mean oh man i didn't think about that i actually had a, a i thought you were going to ask a different question so i keep it i, I go talking heads Oh, interesting. Good. I like that. That's actually a really good one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Once in a lifetime. Just, just be like real. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Burning down the house and you like shoot up everybody. Just Psycho killing, killer. killing, killing a woman. This is not my beautiful wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I w- that's actually really good, Jay. I was thinking, you know. I love that. The, the stones are an easy answer. I'd probably say my favorite. Well, I mean, I'm not saying Radiohead because every time Radiohead is used in a movie, it's used terribly. It's a problem. It's yeah. a problem. Yeah, for sure. Denis Villeneuve. We talked about that a lot. Yeah, we talked about that on Director Watch. This is bad. Stop using it, Denis. Um, yeah, you know what? I, I probably, I was thinking about this today. 
I I was trying to think of like the killers and how like they're also it's not just about using it in the kill. It's also about to get you calm, to get you leveled back mm -hmm. into get like uh, get that heart rate down, get that mood down. And for mm -hmm. me in my life, that's my favorite band. That's Wilco. And they have songs that will get you up mm -hmm. and then they have songs that will mellow you down. And I was thinking about a lot the sequence on the plane where he's paranoid as shit um about like if somebody's going to kill him on that plane and he's going to have to fight his way off and i was uh, so that's what i was thinking about with that so that's that's uh that's what i would do but talking heads yeah david Byrne, that, that's also what i would pick sophia would you use the smiths or would you use somebody else i would use Walk the smiths yeah <laughs> hilarious i mean radiohead or zeppelin like those are also two zeppelin really good, good good options the rights are too expensive, though, so I'm sorry think, to the um, filmmaker who would make that movie. I think um, R.E.M. would be a good uh, assassin band as well. Oh, there's a great R.E.M. needle drop this year in a film you haven't seen yet, Jay. It is. It's oh, wow. really funny. Yeah. Um, oh, yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's incredible. <laughs> um, <laughs> Maestro. There's yeah. an R.E.M. needle drop in Maestro? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Leonard it's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy how you just. It's crazy how you it's got so that like right on that. Used. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, um, is that yeah. actually what it is? Yes, it is. Good job, Jay. Are you serious? Good yeah. job. A gold star. Just Whoa. For you. Oh, man, we just like mind melded in that moment. I, we did. I, yeah, that was crazy. Oh, that was great. Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. Actually, good they, they actually play. Mm -hmm. I assume the end of the world as we know it in Maestro. You'll see. You'll see. You'll see. You'll see, buddy. You'll see. But yeah, I would pick the Smiths and <laughs> the songs I would add, I would add William. It was really nothing. Pretty girls make graves and death of a disco dancer. Yeah. If anyone cares. No, we care. Or loves the Smiths. No, or I know you do, Smith. but <laughs> I'm really acting like a Gen X dad during this episode. So mm -hmm. it's fine. Oh. oh, I think that's great. Um, it all stems back to your conversation with your father about David Fincher. And that's does. how we bring all connects. this baby all the way back around. No, for sure. <laughs> Land um, the plane. There you go. Well, The Killer is on Netflix right now. It's one of the best films of the year. Uh, I feel like I really been... do think that is the case. I think it's one of the best films of the year. I feel Sophia concur. Yeah, I agree. We concur. didn't talk about just how like his direction in this. Y you hand yourself over to a David Fincher movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He just plays you like a puppet yeah he is just such a master of the craft he's uh he's a he's, good guy he's a master of puppets master of killers there you go really. metallica wouldn't actually be a bad one either um i think a little too aggro a little too obvious not as funny yeah you what can if find a killer i don't know if jungle cruise killers. can use it you know oh, what i mean the killers yeah mm, yeah mm -hmm. totally could use mr brightside Right, yeah Sophia? exactly mm -hmm. exactly all right mm -hmm. so okay it's top five fincher time if anyone oh, that's boy. never listened to a top five on the show knows what we do here is we go five to one uh and what we do is we talk about a film all at once rather than have to talk about it three different times so if for whatever reason somebody decides to pick alien three here as their number five we would talk about Alien 3 here, and if somebody else has it on, higher on their list, we would talk about it all in its entirety right then and there. That makes sense? Jay, this is your, Jay, is this your first top five on the show? This is, and I'm going to propose an amendment to the playbook here. Oh, for God's sake. Here we go. <laughs> I think rather than talking about it then, you should talk about it later when the person, like... If you have it at number five and I have it at number one, we should talk about it when I talk about it at number one. I mean, oh, I like that. Yeah, we okay. can like hold it. We can just say like, yeah, okay, say, we'll hold. Pun it, pun it on to the next person. Okay. Well, Jay, when, just, when the enthusiasm is at a fever pitch, Jay just uh, has never listened to the show and decided to bring on different rules. I'm right sorry. You're, I'm sorry that I'm bringing a Fincherian sensibility to this this <laughs> podcast. I, we everything needs to be exactly in its right place for god's sakes okay and actually um, now that i mentioned that let's start the podcast so our second take <laughs> <laughs> uh we, we will some cgi all right we will we will do that that is fine um just means that we're gonna 
wait a couple of seconds in order to do that because we might end up having the same thing. So uh, we'll go Sophia. Bitter Betty over here. We'll go Sophia, Jay, and then myself. So, Sophia, your number five is. Yeah, so first, or we're going to do honorable mentions at the end. We will do honorable mentions like we always do at the end. None of mine are Unless babies. Jay wants to change that as well. <laughs> um, no, we can do honorable mentions at the end. That's fine. Okay, thank okay. you, Jay. Great. <laughs> okay, well, my number five is The Killer, actually. Okay. Um, it feels crazy, I think, wow. to put it in a top five. But after three watches now, call it recency bias, sure. But there is something about this movie to me that just feels very special and i love seeing fincher's precision here but there's also an ease and a levity to it that i really love and um but first i don't think either of you guys have the killer on your list so i can just keep going i don't know i do not go for it no i'm just kidding okay cool um but yeah i think just to add to what we already talked about with our discussion i love the scene between michael fassbender and tilda swinton at dinner she is a regular at this really beautiful restaurant in bedford new york she's wearing a great outfit they tell her or they refer to her earlier in the movie as a q-tip or looking like a q-tip which is brilliant screenwriting they're very funny but just sitting with her watching her enjoy this flight of whiskey and just playing off of fassbender so well it is Not really a conversation because he doesn't speak really in the movie, but it is phenomenal acting from her. And she is one of my favorite working actresses. So I will just add that to our killer discussion. And I think, yeah, it's one of the best movies of the year. And for me, one of the best in his filmography. It's a good movie. It's high Um, praise. I um, It's not that I penalty boxed it. It's just that it's, uh, it's so new for me. And um, so I have it at, at my number eight right now. Um, but it is a movie that, seven. but I haven't, yeah, I have, I have, I have a feeling that it will move up over, over the years uh, to come. Just um, starting out so high for me. And usually they start lower and work their way up. I know. So I was kind of, new one. I was kind of surprised. I was kind of surprised. But three times though, that's probably more than you've seen some other Fincher movies. That's true. Yeah. No, it's more, it's than, more than I've seen my seen... number six and seven. Wow. It's probably more yeah. than you've seen like the game. Oh yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I've there only seen the game once. Me too. I'll revisit it one day. Mm. I bought I the Criterion I, this week. You did? Yeah. So then you can I didn't find watch it though. You didn't watch it though because it's. I used know. it as an excuse to buy it, and then I didn't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, your number five. My number five is kind of his entree into the world of uh, popular cinema. Seven. I'm going with seven. The one that really put him on the map in oh. a film that punt. Oh, yeah. We're going to punt. Yeah. punt for I me forgot too. about my own rule. Yeah. We're going to punt. Yeah. See, mm-hmm. see, this is why you talk about it all at once. But the, but the, but the, <laughs> but the, <laughs> but the <laughs> no, the drama there was so, yeah, oh, I, I felt that in my bones. <laughs> the listener is, has goosebumps right now. Yes. Uh, we can talk about uh, my number five is seven, seven. Okay. Um, all right. Excuse oh, me. So seven and so seven and thank you very much. Um, my number five is the girl with the dragon tattoo. Do I need to punt? Oh, we be punting. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. Well, this is just really great. The listeners have heard one movie discussed in three picks. This is fantastic. My number six. <laughs> Your number six. Oh, the one that just yeah. got kicked out. Oh, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. we probably could have talked about it. Um, then, oh, we'll, you know. Um, all right. Then, Sophia, your number four. Okay. My number four is seven. Do we need to punt again? Yes, we need to punt again. I'm sorry. I was. You have this. You have this higher than four. I have this higher than four. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. So seven and yes. We'll keep going. Uh, right. My number four is a film about a a young child i know i know where this is going he's uh he's seven but it looks a lot older (laughs) Uh, i speak of course about the curious case of benjamin button ryan do we have to punt this one no we don't i bet this is your number four jay this is my number four as well yeah um this is a movie that 
I, I what a what a journey with this movie. I feel like a lot of people are coming around to this movie being good after it being pretty much dismissed when it came out as mm-hmm. Oscar bait. Um, but when I I first saw this movie back in the old 2008, <laughs> I was much more concerned about the girls that I was with at the movie theater than the movie itself. And so good job, buddy. I, I was like, oh, who cares? Whatever. Um, old man uh, looks like a baby. But who cares? Whatever. Um, and then I came back to it as an adult. I hadn't seen it in 12 or 13 years, I would say. And man, this thing hits me like a ton of bricks. I, I find this film and it's partly just this hang up I have within myself where I think about death all the time. It is something I think about way too much. Like a movie like I call Synecdoche, New York, the scariest movie ever made because it really hits at all of my deepest existential dread. And and this film, despite being a movie kind of about the the love that you find in your life and the relationships and bonds that tie people together over the course of their lives, when it is all put in the context of this guy who is aging backwards, it completely like twists it into again, kind of this existential um, pretzel, just my mind to a little bit of an existential pretzel. And uh, the last 25 minutes of this movie absolutely floor me. And especially now that I am a dad, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's tenfold um, what, it, what it was even before. But it's, it's a film that, really explores the ideas of what it means to age and you know that whole adage about youth is wasted on the young and 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 all that stuff it when you even just think about how your life would exist if you had this condition if you were so different than everybody else and how that would make your life so much different even though this is not a man who led a necessarily extraordinary life. It is, you know, Eric Roth who wrote this movie. He also wrote Forrest Gump. He said, Forrest Gump was about an ordinary person in extraordinary circumstances. And Benjamin Button was about an extraordinary person in ordinary circumstances. And I think the latter is a more powerful way to approach a story. And for me, this movie just like it, it, knocked me out and it knocks me out more every time I watch it. I, I think it's so good. Got into the five timers club for you. The five star. I gave it you. five stars. I've got this. My five, my top five here are five star movies. And I understand some, some nits that people can pick the hurricane Katrina thing as the framing yeah. device. Does that totally work? Maybe not. Although really when I think about, out the implications of what that means it sets this apocalyptic backdrop towards this again very existential um, mm-hmm. fable which almost adds more to that dread that i feel when i watch this movie even when i even when i see someone in this movie falling in love i'm like this kind of sucks because they're gonna have to yeah. it, it's gonna have to end prematurely because of his condition in this movie and there is the scene in the in the diner late when kate blanchett is telling uh benjamin button that uh she's pregnant and he's just like well you've got to obviously i i can't be around i cannot be around that it's you can't raise both of us which Mm -hmm. is so earth shatteringly sad to me and then when he is a little a baby old man, a oh, man. baby with dementia, which is Jesus. brutal. Oh. Um, that is where I, I'm just I I'm a, I'm a puddle. I mean, it, it is truly to me one of the more impactful 15 minute spans of film that I can remember. I mean, I, I really do think it is an all time kind of sequence uh, mm-hmm. that. Um, Makes me almost unable to talk coherently on a podcast. Uh, <laughs> Ryan, what do you think? Um, yeah, I, I, I. First off, I, I, if I want to give kudos to anybody, it's to myself uh, for for really also turning Jay onto this because a couple of years ago when we did our when we did our rewatches, 
I told Jay, I was like, no, this, this movie is actually good. And, uh, you know, typical Jay just being like, I don't think so. And then we watched this is that. Not, I, I would. Well, this was, uh, I, I was I, like, I, I think this movie got a lot of flack, like you were saying, because it is that Oscar Beatty sort of thing. It's, well, it does you have know, that very sentimental stamp on it. Yes. But like I said, mm. this movie crushes me. Like it's not, it's not Forrest Gump where no it's this story although a lot of people like to point to like some sort of biting satire that force Gump has that i just I, no I, that I, movie that but, movie sucks but benjamin button is not this movie of like glee and g golly coincidence it's no. a movie about devastating inconveniences yes i mean because it's it's a movie that introduces every character and every one of those characters for the most part, they may have a glimmer of something that he has seen in their life that's good, but then there's also the glimmer of of, of just dread that is going to come with the fact that he's living in an an old folks' home essentially. So anyone that you know teaches him the piano, or reads him a story, or he goes out on an adventure with that person could be gone literally the next day. I think of the. You know, she taught me how to play the piano or the guy that's like, have I ever told you that I've been struck by lightning seven times? And it's just a carousel of 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 loss through larger than light characters. And that's the difference between like Forrest Gump, when it's like everybody in Forrest Gump except Jenny turns out to be fine at the end of that damn movie. And this is everyone experiences what goes on in life, which is pain. And I think that. You know, I agree with you, Jay, like the, the Katrina stuff. I always have to make sure the math is correct because it always I'll, because this movie spans from after World War One all the way up till Hurricane Katrina. So that's a big time frame that they're dealing with. And that's a lot of time. That's somebody's life. And it's ultimately also it's not just his life that we're talking about. We're also talking about Daisy's life throughout it and how you mentioned that scene in the diner. But then there's also the scene at the playground where he where he tells her that she needs a father not a playmate yeah that's the one that, that yeah the diner is where they're talking about how it's going to be hard and then the play and then it happens he's actually just saying i'm i have to leave and then and then this the scene at the birthday party where it's oh they're going to grow up they're going to 18 years and then 18 years later is sort of right around the time when he comes back there's that scene where he's in I think he's in India or it's Thailand or, or Japan or something like that. And it's the, what's on the postcard and he's yeah, Brad Pitt and uh, seven years in Tibet. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, and when he's reading it or Julia Mons reading the, the postcard and then he, and he sort of starts talking about it. It's, it's just all about what a father would want for their child in a world in which they can't tell him any of those things anymore. And then as one would do in this sort of extraordinary scene that you're mentioning, Blanchett goes back and when he has to mention, he's like 12, 13 years old and she, and he's rapidly declining because that's the thing. It's, it's over a couple months, but as somebody dies, they would rapidly decline in their health. So his age, it's not years. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's almost months in which this happens. And it's, I think one of Fincher's, best shots that he has in his entire filmography is just a simple walk down the street between Daisy and baby one or two, like maybe three or four year old Benjamin at that point. And it is completely devastating and beautiful. And then I just think about Pitt and how Pitt is, in my opinion, the best collaborator that's in front of the camera that Fincher's ever worked with. And, um he was initially you supposed seem to, to be forgetting about frank underwood well no we're not doing that today <laughs> um but um but no i think that, geez, i hate you so much but no i just there's there's something kind of we always talk about pitt as this sort of classic hollywood he has the looks of a redford uh, of of a time in which that we don't get movie stars like that and venture uses that that the looks his eyes his smile he uses it throughout, even in CGI that doesn't 100% age well. It's used so perfectly, and most of it works still. It's, I mean, that scene in the water between him and Blanchett 
is just maybe one of the sexiest I scenes. think it's the best he's ever looked on film. Yeah, it's it's incredible. It's yeah. In, yeah. I mean it yeah, <laughs> it is. And that scene There's on the motorcycle. Examples, but... I mean, yeah, I mean I was the scene in which he's got the big like light brown coat and then he's all black underneath and he's walking into the hospital. That's probably the hottest he's ever been for me. Cause it's just this and and play a jet scare. And like Daisy goes, I didn't want him to see me like this because look at him. He's perfect. And like, there's no way to describe it. And uh, yeah, it's that inflection it, it, point where she starts, where he becomes younger quote and unquote, she's going her. older. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very powerful yeah as well i mean but the the, the sequence as as when they're on audio the bed, yeah. visual representation of something that you've never seen before a young child with dementia to yeah. me like breaks me in half it, yeah it, it, it's a very simple thing but it's something that you've never really seen before and it, it it's its power is in its simplicity what a guy i mean and that you it's, talk about like amazing. this the sentimentality that he has it but only fincher can in that sentimentality dissect and talk about death in such a poetic way. Yeah, that's what way. I'm saying. I don't find that yeah. movie terribly sentimental. No, it's not. Way. Like it's 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 got the it's, it's definitely got, classical. Yes, it's got the structure and the shell mm -hmm. of what would be, you know, a sweeping epic of the 40s and 50s, but it's also got the harsh realities of a David Fincher film are like, "Hey, uh death is coming for all of us and you're going to see a lot of it." And it, and it sucks. I mean, like and they Man. Had that, have you all seen that um they had that sure. video the video of david fincher talking about his dad dying was making the rounds recently on on twitter yeah mm -hmm. you all see that yeah mm -hmm. god it's too much yeah too much from a guy that then had then his last movie he he's made a, the, the screen he's a it's, thoughtful a thoughtful guy yeah david fincher yeah. good at his he likes we didn't, we didn't talk about this with the killer i think there's an emotional through line that people aren't really giving the killer and quite enough credit for I think there is an interiority and an insecurity within the killer um, that is not being talked about nearly as much as the the, the wit of the movie and the style mm -hmm. of the movie and the craftsmanship of the movie. But his whole relationship with his, I guess it's his girlfriend. Um, yeah. 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 That is something that is kind of breezed over in the movie, I think purposefully, but speaks so much to that character's inner self, which is something we didn't mm -hmm. talk about. But that's the thing about Fincher. In every Fincher movie, I think about what does what are his how do his movies differentiate themselves from others like them? Mm -hmm. And it, it's the scenes in Seven where they're drinking wine and having dinner, right? Those yeah. where they're really focused on character. He mm -hmm. has such a care for the people in his movies that so many other people's operating. So many other people operating in these genres uh, just don't have. He's yeah. he's a very, for as much credit as he gets as a stylist and a craftsman, which he deserves, he's also a very emotionally attentive storyteller. Yeah. Sophia, this isn't on your list, obviously, but. It's um, not on my list, but I have to say I watched it for the first time since high school this yeah. week. And the ending obliterated me. I was yeah. sobbing. It was it was a lot. I think that idea again of just nothing lasts. That's it's really really hard to to deal with. And I think I needed to just be a little bit older to oh, for sure. get oh, it. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I'm I'm telling you, give it two three more years. You do another rewatch. It might be up. Weirdly, here. Ben Button didn't quite hit when I was 17. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, but I, I really liked it. And I think the only thing it has in common for me still with Zemeckis is I do think that the, the makeup and the, the CG is a little uncanny valley at times, but I think with future rewatches, I'll be fine with it. It really isn't a distraction, but I don't think the sentimentality is really a thing in the movie. I think it's just very human, very yeah. real. And it's a different way to tell that story. I mean, even that shot of his father his real father passing away and him sitting behind him and then when they go to the funeral queenie goes like then you know basically it's just like that guy didn't give you nothing you know and he's going to be buried next to your mom and he goes no you're my mother because i've lived a life with you and then mm -hmm. at her funeral it's i mean it's it's 
it's just those little moments that kind of sneak up on you in the film. It's it's not about being sentimental or it's not about trying to manipulate you. It's about you go through life with all these people and then when they're gone, life can be such a sad, lonely place. And so you hope that there's someone that you know there when it's all done. And it's and you know, truths can be withheld, but at the at that that moment there's an understanding like she talks about the look that baby Benjamin right before he passes looks right in her eye and that he knew and she knew that they were there so he wasn't alone much like the people that he's gone through so yeah it's oh lord (laughs) it's incredible down on the bayou (laughs) like the smiths say at the end of the killer to die by your side is such a heavenly way to die Oh, Daisy, to die by your side will be a <laughs> heavenly way to die. Anyway, That's why I said it. That's what I was hoping for. I would love to hear your uh, accent if you could do that, Sophia. Um, oh, my God. I, okay. I mean, we really need it in the Frank Underwood voice. Oh, do, do, oh, let me be Frank. Do not start with him. He he cannot do that tonight. It's, no, the, no. it's the holiday season. No. Everyone no. knows what that means. It's time Jay, for a let me be Frank. Jay, I'm I, coming back. I will mute you. No, 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 no. Shout out to, um, I love an alternate studio logo. And in this oh, the one, buttons? they're all buttons. The buttons, yeah. 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 I liked that too. Gotta love them and buttons. And so do I. I'm Frank Underwood. No, you're not. You're Jay Ledbetter. All right. <laughs> Sophia, you're number three. I imagine this is going to get punted, but my number three is the social network. That is my number three as well. And that is my number three. Oh, as well amazing okay let's talk about it now um i so punt. think no, i'm just kidding <laughs> this movie i think is the defining movie of the 2010s um i think Pretty that... crazy to have the defining movie of a decade be your third best movie yeah. i know yeah for me i i'll explain my one and two and why i, I put them there but I'm not a huge fan of Aaron Sorkin, but I think that the combination of Sorkin's writing here with Fincher's direction is perfect. I am a fan of the writing, let's say, here. I meant that in general. I saw your face, Ryan, so I need to clarify. Well, um, I mean, there's I like that- there's like a before Sorkin and there like when he was doing really good stuff. I think post Moneyball, it's very shady. Yes. Modern Sorkin now is when he directs his Yes. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. think when he has yeah, somebody we, there, there's a BD taking his material for director like this, mm-hmm. like you're about to say, Sophia, I think that this is when he's at his best when somebody well, can rein it in. But he also it also yeah. needs to be filtered through some someone else. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And that's exactly to. what this is here, because Fincher, it's, you know, his precision, his knack for mood that takes everything that Sorkin puts here and does put it through a filter. It's that procedural that quick script and i think that the combination here and the way that fincher reigns him in um works really well right it's i think the film yes it's incredibly prescient in many ways telling the story of the decade and i think only a way that david fincher could do i think i know we're all going to talk about it here but for me this movie is like the depiction of the american dream through a lens that I think works really well for our time. You have this like very troubled, troubled, lonely man. This is more akin to Citizen Kane than Mank is really for me. And I think that the the bouncing back and forth between these flashbacks and the present day scenes, the editing in this movie, it's brilliant. It's operatic. It says my favorite Reznor and Ross score. Also, I love the music. And I it's it's just it's one where before this rewatch. I've watched this film dozens of times. It's one of my most rewatched movies. And I, you know, this is I was, such a rewatchable movie. It's, it's so rewatchable. And I was deciding like, is this going to be in my top five? Do I just put it in my top five? Because I think that's where everyone puts it. Like, it just feels like it belongs there. But where is it actually for me? And then I rewatched it last night and said, yeah, you know, there's a reason why I love this one and why it's one of my most rewatched venture films. I love it. So I want to hear more from you guys too, because I know we all have all have it here. If anything, I feel like I'm underselling it. I assume someone would have it at one or at I know. least two. That's why. I, why did I say? I bet it gets punted yeah. when I put it at three. <laughs> so I've got it at three, and I was looking at um our the name of our podcast. Actually, I wanted to confirm this so that I could make this joke, but it's called the Awards Watch Podcast, and I've got one recommendation. 
<laughs> Drop the. It's cleaner. <laughs> Our podcast go. does not have a clean title. Um, this movie rocks. Rewatched this one recently as well. Um, you are so right about the Sorkin. The Sorkin Fincher equilibrium is so perfect here. You have the cynicism of Fincher and kind of the idealism of Sorkin, which can be so grating at times. Mm -hmm. um, but that combination, I think, works so incredibly perfectly. And you can just look at how prescient this movie was. I, I don't think I... You heard about, oh, they're making a movie about Facebook <laughs> when this movie was coming out. And you're like, mm -hmm. who cares? And now it is one of the predominant forces in the modern world um and he just nabbed i mean he kind of blew rooney mara up with this one obviously their working relationship would continue eisenberg is incredible in this movie i almost think he's underrated because he's doing kind of less than some of the other people in the movie uh andrew garfield obviously coming into our lives here is a, a great win for everybody and look timberlake rocks in this Timberlake is very good in this, I think. And I think it is a little bit of one of those things where Fincher is manipulating the person into giving a great performance. Whereas if you were asking Timberlake on set, would you have been like, you are aware that you're playing like a giant tool, right? He would be like, no, no, he's like a cool guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, that That's kind of the, the kind of how I feel when I, when I watch that performance, but the stylization, I mean, the just the the rowing sequences with Hail to the Mountain King and um, like the club scene where Timberlake and, and Eisenberg are talking and they have to use subtitles because the sound in the club is so loud, which is so evocative of that experience. Um, it's just so well paced, so quotable. It is it is absolutely one of the defining films of the last 15 years, and it's his third best movie. <laughs> Everybody else, step your game up. I mean, I I I texted Sophia last night after I rewatched it, and I went, I think this is the movie that defines our generation, and I think that it it's because and and I'm not saying that it's the movie of our generation, but if you want to know what our generation is and the ramifications of the future as well as of the past. I think that this is the movie that you go to, you put this on, you go, that's what it was like. And that's what this generation's legacy is. This thing that is built upon the back of a liar and a backstabber, a sexist, a manipulator. And he's fighting up against liars and sexist and manipulators and billionaires and people from money. And the only person that is rootable in this is Eduardo. And it's because why? Because he put his trust in a bunch of people that he shouldn't have. And, he does some stupid stuff. And he does some he stupid knows. things. But at the end of the day, you know, we all do stupid things when we're young. But he was easily manipulated. And I do not feel <laughs> sorry for... um for any of these people outside of him. And what's really interesting is at the time in which this movie came out, Facebook was more favorable in the zeitgeist. It still had the, it wasn't near, he wasn't nearly the monster or it had nearly had gone South as, as the public figure that is more exactly. I don't think now. this movie doesn't really have much of an opinion of, of Facebook, the entity. No, but I think I that think. that was the I thing. That the was other than the fact that it is of kind of the I think the, the ending the distancing, does distancing of people. I think is definitely. I think I that. Think it, oh, mine. oh, go ahead, go ahead, Ryan. No, I was I was just going to say is that I think that at the time when this movie came out, Zuckerberg wasn't the monster that he was, and so you could look at it, even though he is is a monster in this movie, you could very much see it as. Well, you know, the Winklevoss twins and all of them, they're terrible people too, you know, and it's just, you know, because he's not, Sorkin, like a, he's not, he's not a, a monster is because too so, far for what he is in the he, movie. He is. I loathe him in this movie. He is a monster in this movie. And, and I did when it came out. And like I think I, I had a hard time watching it. But Sorkin puts, so much. but Sorkin puts that dialogue at the end of the movie mm -hmm. that is like, you're not an asshole, Mark. You're just trying really hard to be one essentially. Yeah. And 
that's where you can go yeah he's just he's it's all you know numbers and figures and everything and, and through mm-hmm. that you're going to be a, a massive dick now through time this movie has aged like a fine wine because he's he's you know he's yeah. uh he's terrible and he's in i was watching it on the rewatch this time and i sent photos to sophia i should have sent it to you jay because i was sitting there going this is the closest thing maybe we've had to the godfather in such a long long time there's the scene in the middle of the film it's literally at the halfway point of this movie where they're talking about uh the winklevoss twins and it's between eduardo and mark and it literally almost is frame for frame line for line what Kay and michael are talking about at the end of the godfather and then in the final shots of godfather part two and this one of these very lonely people that are at the top of their profession and what is what happens with michael you see them zoom out sitting alone by himself what happens with mark zuckerberg he's just sitting at his own website just hitting refresh over and over and over again because at the end of the day what has this all been about it hasn't been about the phoenix club it hasn't been about that is the, the money and everything element of the movie it's it is a, like mm-hmm. all of this is rooted in one it's because the girl memory yeah it's because of the girl that Sorkin broke his heart her. and he's and he's a dweeb about it and i think that mm-hmm. it's that mix of Sorkin writes a lot of populist products as well as also Fincher being this meticulous filmmaker, that dialogue with this, this editing and this direction the, to get these performances, it is, it had to probably have been a nightmare to put together um, in film, but it works. It is a movie that defines an era and Jay's right. It's one of the best films of the last 25 15 25 years insanely rewatchable and i think the thing is is that because it's also of the fight club thing because it's his most celebrated film we sit back and we devalue it a little bit in our minds we're like oh well everybody likes this that's movie that's totally possible and so therefore and it's the one that he got the this closest to the oscar so well oh, let's take a little step back and oh let's not try to talk about it and oh it's on everybody's top 10 list for of the decade and you know well maybe we just value let's it a little give bit that king some credit he did great on the speech <laughs> he did do really, really good job did overcome speech. the odds mm-hmm. um but speech. but it also is it's undeniable it's an undeniable mm-hmm. film yeah it's it like number three but it's like i could have easily put yeah. it at number one it's just the other two movies a smidge better for me uh but me too yeah i think it's yeah. just it's just an incredible piece of filmmaking yeah like, i actually yeah. thought more of oppenheimer when i was watching it that too time. yeah the <laughs> creation like the of idea this of like the creation of something that becomes really destructive and dangerous in a you know different way obviously um but the way that it goes between these like legal scenes and then the past and the creation mm-hmm. of that has rather thin and female characters something that sorkin and nolan both have issues with but it's also a product of the way that the men in the film view women women um, yeah. and i think again like at the end of the film what i like about it is not just the idea that he's refreshing this page because he wants erica to accept his friend request but it comments further i think on the addiction piece of social media that like the dakota johnson character says where she's like it's so addictive i go on it or check it five times a day it's like even he's addicted to his own his own creation in a in a really dark way and that's what's coming and it's going to destroy the world so yeah, yeah. because i mean yeah. it's just that, that that whole movie to me is just about kind of it's the changing of the guard of mm-hmm. the bullies of the world yeah. Whereas the, yep. the Winkle Vi uh, are kind of the old guard of power. Uh, in the, it's in not the, the muscle. Of- it's not the muscle anymore. It's the keyboards. Yeah, it's yeah. The, it, exactly. Yeah. And Eisenberg's so, so good as Zuckerberg as this like soulless, horrible, like not even a real human. Like I can't even see him but as a, a guy, real person. A, a guy who sort of grew up when the rules were the opposite of what they are now he sort of changed the rules to where you don't have to be the six six rower to hold all the cards now you can just Mm -hmm. be some bitter nerd who still thinks the deck is stacked against him even though it's not anymore and that's kind of what drives him is that people still hate me and the only way that i can get back at them is by getting more power even when he has all the power yeah i mean him sitting in that room 
he's a chill guy. And just being like at the end of the movie, being like, really, I have to sign a check? Not knowing, you know, he's still naive, but by mm-hmm. that time, the film comes out and then the years to come, he's his power and his also just lack of self-awareness because that's the thing that happens throughout the film is that we see it just the way he treats it water the way he treats women the way he so treats funny. everyone it's the lack of awareness that he has then that we now see as this person even if he is you know he can donate all the money he wants he can grow up and you know have a family or whatever but he still built a company and built a brand off the back of all this just deceitful nature and and created himself to be this this monstrous king of online culture and and that then feeds into having like twitter and instagram that he bought and then you know you have the the must of the world and, and everything like well we're getting that one now we're getting Aronofsky that one now Musk movie, get excited yeah, that's true we didn't mention can't that wait. can't wait for that that's uh from darren aronofsky a, a director will never do a top what five if the, what here. if the whale made cars <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's a pretty undeniable film. I agree. I think Iceberg's fantastic. Uh, Garfield Hammer in a dual performance is, is still very good. That effect um, holds up too. Yeah, it does. I, I think mm-hmm. I think Jay though, you're right. Like, and so does him as a guy. Barney. No, no, stop it. Um, but I think. Oh, I agree. No, no, I will mute you if you keep it up. <laughs> Armin um, Hammer is my favorite actor. <laughs> stop it. Um, but I think that. I think that Timberlake might sneakily be the MVP of this movie because of just the what? of of just how he is <laughs> such a punchable piece of shit and this yeah, this but... puppet master behind the scenes. Even though he, it goes back to what Garfield was saying too about in the film. It's just like I love how you know standing next to you, Sean, because it just I look so tall and I look I'm just look so much better. But he's such a weakling. But every move is is done at just such a you know it's it's such a weasel way out and then of course by the end of it too his downfall in it as well like it, it's yeah i think jay might be right he might have lucked into this performance from from fitcher but fitcher also doesn't get a lot of bad performances um i think of maybe another film that might be talked about where a certain actor Sean that's parker invented napster yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> You're, um but uh, there's another that's actor weird, that was a weird name drop in yeah <laughs> um that also falls in line i think with that too of like you wouldn't think of them giving good performances but fincher's able to do that and that's sort of the brilliant nature of it but yeah it's one of the best films of you know the last of the 2010s and in easily one that defines the time um all right number twos uh so so via your number two okay well i'm so much happier now that i'm dead technically missing soon to be presumed dead gone i love gone girl so much it's one of my comfort movies and i just shared that with rosamund pike this weekend when i spoke with her wow. <laughs> about saltburn you and you and Anne hathaway right isn't she the one that said it was her favorite rom-com, rom-com? which yeah. it is yeah. yeah it is um i think based on you guys i don't need to punt this no, one it's just my number six okay it's it's my it's, number six as well hey look at that jay um it's yeah. it was it's close it was real close it's just numbers game numbers yeah game. But i love just it just like this is my fincher movie yeah i talk about gone girl all the time i saw it like when it i remember like when i was in college and it came out i like had i had read the book first um it's of course based on gillian flynn's very popular novel again this is fincher like going into the the schlock airport book the seller mm-hmm. um and what i really love about it right this story of nick and amy dunn it's a poor it's marriage as a portrait of narcissism like i like the way that you know in when you're dating or you're in the early days of a relationship you put your best foot forward it's it's a performance really and it's an ideal and marriage is what happens when the truth comes out and when that veneer is shattered or dissolves and i like fincher and flynn's take on that and how this movie like really gets into what happens when you know the truth about someone and i think that's why the film works i think that ben affleck as nick dunn for me is my favorite casting decision in decades truly i mean he he looks like scott peterson 
in the park, which is part of the reason why it works. Um, you bring that knowledge of that case, I think, to it if you're familiar with it. But just his kind of like schleppy, like Midwest salt of the earth guy, like who moved to New York. Like you can you can buy him as a Nick Dunn, as that type B man and why he would fall for Amy, but also why she would like him. I think Rosamund Pike is perfection as Amy. And I love that when Fincher was searching for his Amy Dunn, he loved that. He thought that Pike was unknowable. He had seen her in a number of films and couldn't put a finger on her. And he felt like she was a modern day Faye Dunaway. He wanted Faye Dunaway in Chinatown. That was the type of performer he wanted. And I feel like She's just absolutely incredible in it. it. Has great editing. I love, you know, they will sh- when they cut back and forth from Amy reading her diary in the early days of her relationship um, to the present after Amy is missing. There's a shot when they're about to kiss in the past, and then it cuts directly to um, Nick Dunn getting his mouth swabbed. Um, it's just like brilliant little, like gross, like dirty details like that that Fincher plays with so beautifully and i think this movie is so so funny i cannot stop laughing every time i watch it and i do think the movie like it has problems for me once you know amy is sort of coming undone and she has to scramble and we have the desi scenes i lose i lose interest i think in the movie more there because of neil patrick harris i think it's kind of a poor casting decision and i don't love the performance but I love the movie too I'm much to like not it. have it up this high. Really? J Dog, you yeah. like it? I think he's appropriately. That's another one of those brilliant. It's in the same way that Ben Affleck is, <laughs> I think, to a certain extent, a piece of meta casting. I think mm-hmm. the Neil Patrick Harris thing is too, where it's this guy who feels like he's been spurned by the world around him a little bit. And I think Neil Patrick Harris really exudes that sense of. David Fincher loves examining public personas versus Mm -hmm. interiority. And I think Neil Patrick Harris in that movie, both because of our association with him as a viewer to the actor, as well as kind of his character and how he feels like he should have gotten, you know, a a better hand. I keep going back to decks of cards as metaphors, but um he, uh, uh, I, I no. think that association really works for. Oh, I didn't even think about that. God damn it! Truly, God. we are we God are playing with some might say a house of cards. All right, okay. Um, All right. Anyway, but I I I think that's a really smart utilization of Neil Patrick Harris in that movie. But I I, I get it. It's a in a vacuum. I don't know that it's a great performance, but I think the relate relationship that we have with neil patrick harris the actor as an element to that yeah Mm. i i have it like i said at number six it is i love this movie a lot um i i I kind of and maybe sophia i'm wrong um i know how much you love phantom thread and this is like almost like i feel like at times fincher's way of making a phantom thread the power dynamics in this movie the second the new new rewatch that I was watching it. I mean, especially the last 30 minutes of this movie, it's very much about this marriage and who has control and, and the idea of, 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 for me, at least between that scene in which she's sitting there next to Neil Patrick Harris, she's eating the dessert. And that's the point when she realizes that's the man that she married Mm -hmm. is when he is saying the line of like, I'm taking you like, I would go to his chin, touches the chin and I would go to the woodshed for you. And she knows that he knows that she knows that it's very, very, very good. I it's agree. Just, it's it's so, so funny. funny. And <laughs> it's commentary, obviously, on mass media, how we consume these stories and how quickly, right, when they are resolved, that I love that scene where, where um, the b- fake Nancy Grace character comes comes in the house and Affleck basically says, you said that me and my sister had coronal relations and that I killed my wife. And you and she's just like, yeah, but I got you a robot dog so we're forgiven right you know it's it's little things like that throughout 
the movie that I think is fantastic. Another like against type character uh, or against type casting too that I I think Tyler is Perry. is fantastic as Tyler Perry in the movie. He's great. He's yeah. great. Um, you know, Carrie Coon, obviously Coon. very important to Jay, perfect. very important to me, very important to Sophia. Just mm-hmm. absolute perfect casting there as go. Um, Pike's phenomenal. Affleck though, as much as like when you first see the film, it's the Rossman Pike show and you're, and you're and you know, she's the titular gone girl. Like Affleck's casting he is, is so insane. In and it just shows like in, in, in his sort of relationship to uh the the funny nature that he uh has now with with Fincher, they're really connected and, and they talk a lot. It seems like uh, uh you know, I was I was reading a little bit about uh air this year and how he kind of he called david for a couple of things as well too so it was and of course that conversation right they had that they had around mank it seems like they're so comfortable together they've tried to make other films since like i think they were doing a strangers on a train uh remake that just didn't work out um has got six thousand he's got six thousand of, mm-hmm. of those um but yeah it's leagues under the sea it's 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 wild. It's over the top. It's scandalous, but it's to the to the extent of like exactly exaggerated, right to the right point. I mean, I think of like the blood, right when when she kills Desi and how that blood is kept on her throughout when she comes uh-huh. home, when she goes to the hospital, when she comes back to the house, all the way upstairs. And she's like, sh- like get in the shower. I need to make sure you're not wearing yeah, wearing a wire. wire. It's the whole thing. It's great. Oh. Absolute fantastic power dynamics in sort of a nightmarish situation, and then by the end, it's it's they're they're trapped. And she and wins. I, she wins. I love that. And it's 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 wonderful. It's a and I love how it starts and how it ends and and yeah. Mm-hmm. I just more I more know. Affleck roles yeah. like this, please. More for Pike. She's extraordinary. I think this year in Saltburn, yeah. but it's the performance of Elijah, and it's so interesting that this was almost Reese Witherspoon and I. Think John Hamm, right? Was that I'm not mistaken? Yeah, or that John was Hamm. the mm-hmm. John Hamm could have done it, but Reese Witherspoon could Reese, not have done it. Yeah, Reese bought the rights. It was one of those like she, you know, she got the book, you know, like the Craw Daddy book. And and the, the but this was the, the original this movie feel I'm sure somebody else could do a good job, but they're so perfect as is. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I, I can't even consider any alternatives. But this this is maybe the best example because this thing was a huge big hit. old hit. This yeah, yeah. The blockbuster. The content in this movie is very, very R-rated, but people came in droves. That's because that Fincher book is magic. so popular. It, I mean, mm-hmm. it definitely did have something to do with the book too. Yeah, but his ability to make people put up with stuff that they might not usually put up with, I think, is one of his superpowers. Well, it's the yeah. superpower also of taking a, a airport novel and elevating it to prestige cinema and no one really else is able to do something like that because he finds things in these movies to talk about that others just don't they think of just like like the the stuff between like why she left or the like i think of like a rip-off movie of like the girl on the train or girl books like that. That, that yeah there's that other gillian mm-hmm. flynn one too with charlie's theron i can't remember what that one was called oh, oh dark, places. Edge, dark edge places of dark places yeah. yeah places or edge yeah. of darkness um darkness, but. Uh, but no it's just like these books that are like the mystery to these filmmakers are more important than what's actually could be said about everything that's going on here and that's what fincher is so interested in it's in 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 this movie too, and working with Flynn, who wrote the screenplay too, and not being afraid to, I even uh, to poke fun at her own material, um, and and her creation, which is a very, um, which is not easy for an artist to do. But when you're, but Fincher's a very trustworthy guy, and and so I think that that's really that's such a really interesting way of adapting a book, much more, and that's why the screenplay I think is immaculate in so many ways it's my six but like it's mostly my six just because i do agree with jay like i think some of the stuff in that middle bit with with neil patrick harris it loses a little bit of steam um but uh, the ending again the last 30 minutes of the movie probably you know i mean it's just some of the most entertaining shit you can have it's one of those where like i know it's not on paper like the best or most perfectly no no no. it's It's just like my favorite no i get it a lot of (laughs) no it's a super popular film and it's Mm -hmm. also 
I mean, if I have it no, at number rocks. six, he's got five other movies that are better, and yeah. that's saying a lot because no, not a lot of people have one movie that's as good as that on their filmography. Yeah, that's so, true. Um, Jay, your number, your number two. Before I get to my number two, I just want to mention I saw this clip the other day of Quentin Tarantino talking about David Fincher, and I think this was when Tarantino was younger. I think it might have been on Charlie Rose. Okay, and he was like, "Who's the best director working today?" And I think Tarantino said. Oh, well, it's probably David Fincher. But here's the thing about David Fincher. He doesn't write his movies. That's what separates me from David Fincher. And I, I was like, I'm going to stuff you in a locker, you nerd. Get out of here. <laughs> anyway, apropos, apropos of nothing. Uh, that was something I saw recently. Um, right, my number two is if Gone Girl is Sophia's Fincher movie, my Fincher movie. Hold on. Let me grab my glasses here. <laughs> <laughs> total, total audio medium and you're doing a visual gag uh, great for an audio medium i am currently wearing my glasses around my neck like um daniel craig's character mikhail bloomquist in uh the girl with the dragon tattoo which to me is just if you kind of just talk about really giving david fincher whole cloth you get to do whatever you want with this movie. We're going to give you a giant property. We're going to let you make a blockbuster. And for him to give you this movie is stunning to me. I think this film is marvelously edited. I think it might be his best looking movie. Yeah. And I think some of that just has to do with the locations and, and the budget and um, some other elements as well. But it's just a gorgeous looking movie. You're in kind of this Scandinavian landscape with um, so much light, which you don't always see in a Fincher movie, but all that snow and the brightness, the long days, I think are a huge asset for him in this movie. And just two of his most memorable protagonists between Blomquist and uh, Elizabeth Salander, the titular girl with the dragon tattoo. Um, Daniel Craig just decided not to do an accent, which rocks. Yeah, uh, everyone else is mm-hmm. doing a Swedish accent <laughs> and he's just a bit of Daniel Craig. But um, Rooney Mara in this as Elizabeth Salander, total transformation. I mean, this the I know the casting search for Elizabeth was extensive. Yeah. And did anybody and everybody. And they gave it to Rooney Mara and she now just owns that role. It kind of blows my mind they didn't make a sequel to this. I really feel like this could have been a big franchise. This movie did well. It didn't do. I think that that was, well. I think that that was the point is that they wanted it to do. Cause social network does really well, I believe for what that movie is. And it, it it's made coming off the, Yeah. And I think they want it because this is an international sensation uh, and a phenomenon of a book. They wanted, I think essentially what he got with gone girl, which is this, this, you know, big giant hit. The problem is, is that like you, you, you marketed it as the Phil bad movie of the damn holiday season. People are going to be kind of put off by that. Like the trailers, one of the great teaser trailers of all, one time. of the great teaser trailers of all mm-hmm. time. But if you're doing it for a mass audience, it's probably not the way you want to go. You know I would what say I mean? Christmas is probably not the time to release this movie, but that's just no. my opinion. Um, but as, as for the film itself, I mean, this is David Fincher process at its most, uh, yeah, kind of mundane to a certain extent. And he's also leaning into the digital technology that we mm-hmm. now have at our fingertips. Never before have people scrolling through pictures on their laptop felt as energetic as they do in this movie. It is tense to a T. It is palpable in every single sequence. There's a great cast of character actors. And it's also this film that is very much about kind of like what I was talking about earlier. It's all about how you publicly present yourself. Uh, and, and when I watched the movie today, the conclusion I came to was that the girl with that dragon tattoo is basically a series of cost benefit analyses of being uh, polite or rude in any given circumstance, because <laughs> You have have Blumquist, who is this guy who is so um, presentable and so um, concerned with how other people see him in these circumstances because he's grown up in kind of this corporate uh, world and this world where he has to get interviews and things. Whereas you have Elizabeth Slander, who's working completely behind the scenes, completely incognito, and she is almost 
aggressively abrasive to the people around her. And because of that, she is exploited because people understand that that's a, in the eyes of the public, you will lose if you are the less presentable person in any given scenario. And the, the most graphic twist the movie takes at a certain point occurs when Daniel Craig doesn't want to be rude to Stellan Skarsgård. He's just like, oh, I don't want him to think I'm a bad guy. I know he's a murderer, but I don't want to be rude. And then he gets sent to a murder dungeon. And it's um, it's just wonderfully, it's so dark. It's so, th this is, uh, there's probably an argument to be made that this isn't true, but this pushes buttons in ways that almost none of his other films push them. It is such, it, it is a visceral, visceral film that tackles things that, very rarely are tackled and i kind of appreciate that level of transgression um in and of itself i think there's value in that and so for me this thing the editing of this it feels like an action movie to me it is so satisfying in every way and and also emotionally fulfilling the final shot of the film with elizabeth on her motorcycle <sighs> is devastating uh and that's the fincher that's what separates fincher for me from great to one of the true greats yeah. um so girl with the dragon tattoo love it my it's my number five i know we punted it earlier i love this movie i think it's just a a mean green process machine um but process in a way that's a piece of work i think it really is i think that it you know it, it's a it's about these two people that are really desperate and and in needing of each other in a world that's about killers and rapists and misinformation and all these different Nazis. things and Nazis. And it's all this, just this tension that's sort of building up and up and up and up. Um, I think that this is the definitive version of this story. Uh, I know that there are the new me for, for me, this, this, this is elevated because of Fincher's level of detail and his just immaculate way of being able to make you feel the dread that these characters are living in the craft environment in this thing is, is like undefeated it's incredible it's i mean crazy. um to be your follow-up to the social network to to be a uh, essentially i think a year later if i'm not mistaken too um or two years later and and have this thing come out at the holidays and and yet i've watched it so many times over and over again i think mara's performance not only deserves that Oscar nomination. I think she should have won the Oscar that year. It's it's such a um, star turning performance. I think Craig's phenomenal. Christopher Plummer, Stalin Sarsgaard, all of them just giving really really solid solid work. But again, it's it's you know for him to follow up the, uh, the social network, a movie about social media and information and how we're uh, going to start essentially marketing it to everyone, to then make a movie about a journalist who's information bit him in the ass and now he has to solve this whole crime in order to rehabilitate his image to get the information that he needed in his original case correct and it's just all these different layers to how you clear your name but then also how you can feel safe again you can be trusted it's a movie that's definitely about trust that i find so fascinating and then of course jay like you mentioned how is that trust then built? It's built through relationships, working together, grinding through it. And then you build from trust um, attachment. You build fondness. And I think that when she's getting that leather jacket, she knows so much about his life more than he, his friend says. It's the line that he says when he first meets her. That leather jacket and when he sees that he's moved back into his normal life after everything mm -hmm. is cleared, and she realized how disposable she is to him, even though that might not be the case. Just because there is this intense intimacy when they're behind the exactly. scenes looking at these laptops and looking at these pictures. But looking at, at well, also day, he's got to go to these banquets and things and he's going to be with the person that he thinks gives him the most leverage to do whatever he wants to do moving forward. Yeah, it's very it's transactional. The, it's very transactional societal norms. And she sees that in that driving away but then tossing of the jacket into the garbage can it's devastating it's probably it's it it's right up there with ben button in terms of some of the most devastating moment in fincher's filmography and it sadly 
we'll, we'll never get to see the next two installments or a continuation because one, um, you know, Mara stated that she got all those piercings, all those, you know, all those things. And she was only going to have, she was only doing it once essentially. And they couldn't agree on, on, um, what was it? They couldn't agree on budget. But then of course this property has now gone through the ringer essentially in, uh, having a terrible remake and, and a bunch of other films that just, just don't work. And so, um, once again, people trying to mimic what Fincher can do and not doing it to the successful other oh, successful uh, way of that they think that the mystery is what is the most interesting part of this rather than the characters and their emotional state. And that's what I find so fascinating about the girl with the dragon tattoo. Sophia, you had this where on your list? It's this my number six. Six. So I was just I right on the outside looking. I do think it's Fincher's like most beautiful movie. His mm-hmm. like technical marvel. Mm-hmm. I think I just need to watch it more. Yeah. Um, I remember when I first saw it being a little disappointed with her character compared to the book. She's very mm-hmm. vivid in the book. I mm-hmm. like I remember in reading it and she has this like very sharp characterization and she you know narrates a good amount of it. And he, I remember when I first saw it, she felt very secondary to him. So I think I just need I need more more watches with it, but I do really love it. Um, again, it's a like a four and a half star <laughs> film for me. <laughs> so it's one they, of those things they where are not, a, they're separated for a large chunk of the movie, but then it's yeah. like De Niro and Pacino freaking meeting at the diner. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm. It's one that I'm excited to watch more, like in the future. It is also a hard watch for me. It's a. It it's is. one where it you is. can it's, be in it's the mood very for it. dark. Yeah. Like, yeah. Movie. I saw the movie three times in theaters and I still don't know how I saw it three times in theaters. No, was, there's one scene lot. in particular. That's yeah. It's just, yeah. Very yeah tough, I think but, back to it now yeah. and I go, cause I think everybody wanted to see it with me and I got dragged to it. Mm-hmm. But I remember on the third watch, I was like, it happens. I think I got to go to the bathroom for this, for this <laughs> scene. Yeah. It's a lot. You know what it's yeah. like. You get dragged to the movie. Everybody oh, wants to see it and you're the please. movie person. So, you know what yep. I mean? I, I, there are plenty like that for me already yeah. this year. <laughs> if you want to talk about what is the most movie that Fincher has ever made, it's Dragon uh-huh. Man too. It's like yeah. five different movies in one. It's yeah, like, it's, it all works. It's, it's crazy. Cra- it's, cra- it's a crazy. It's, it's crazy so, movie. So and the and the um those that title sequence is just oh like, for God's yeah. sakes! I mean, Ooh. just <laughs> so good. Yeah, I mean, in a different tone, kind of than the rest of than what you first get into with the movie, which I really mm-hmm. like about it because it feels like it's going to be this kind of like relentless, fast thing at the beginning, and then it kind of it's a, settle it's, into it. That's why, like, yeah. the killer was again uh-huh. using it almost similarly in that way to subvert yeah. your audience expectations. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think have the, all the Reznor, Reznor score in Dragon Tattoo is as good as anything they've done. I think. Agreed. It's so propulsive. So yeah. good. I prefer Social Network, but it's right up there. Yeah, it's fantastic work. All right. Um, my number two is seven. So seven. So seven. Um, Let's go back in um, back in my yeah. list. Here. Sophia's number four. My number four. Jay's number five. five. Um, I think that uh, King Fincher likes the process. I think that um, nothing better than watching it first come on full. I mean, it's it's about movie stars. Uh, Morgan Freeman, Brad Pitt, sort of working together. Just the, these two cops that are sort of at at odds with one another. For me, what I just love about it is Jay mentioned it a scene earlier, and this is the scene that then starts turning this movie, the rest of the movie, into something fascinating. It's that that dinner sequence in which uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's character calls the the office and tells um, Somerset to come to dinner, and they have this this moment where they break bread and they laugh over the train and everything, and and a scene like that it's probably like two seconds and it really doesn't mean that much but it tells so much and it raises the stakes and it gets you to an emotional place for me that you're then to buy into the the rest of this ridiculous story of this murdering psychopath and i think then as they're sort of uncovering it throughout i mean this is a you know as biblical and as as dark as you're going to see you know we talk about dragon tattoo being dark but seven's right up there in terms of his dark vivid imagery i mean like the the what is it like the the books Uh, i always think back to like the 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 diaries the handwriting is they had interns do those yeah they had interns do it it's (laughs) like maniac just a maniac doing it but i think then obviously when john doe comes into the fold 
this movie is elevated to another level. Spacey's performance. Oh. No, God damn it. I knew you were going to do it again. Spacey's performance is incredible. In this, this is one of my finest performances. There you go. And I think then just everything that happens in the last 30 minutes of this movie is so propulsive and so nerve wracking that every time I watch it, I it's like I'm seeing it for the first time again. And I don't know of many movies that do that. I mean, Sophia, you texted me that your sister, I believe, did I'll tell had, the story. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to tell it real quick, I mean, yeah, like, so I was. This is how I, I felt watching it. This is again. crazy. So I watched this movie when I was in middle school and was traumatized by it. And so then, like, my parents wouldn't let my sister watch it, and my sister's three years younger than me. And I was, you know, I put this on the other night because I um, wanted to rewatch it for this. And um, my sister told me that she'd never seen it before all the way through. And I was like, hold on a second. I need to make sure I don't spoil this. But like, you know what happens at the end, (laughs) you know what happens at the end. Right. And she mentioned that she knew the what's in the box line, but didn't actually know what was in the box or what that meant. And it was just the best, like one of the best viewing experiences I've had of this movie, because watching it with someone who somehow doesn't know that (sighs) was just so fun. It was like watching it over again for the first time. But yeah, it works so well. The ending is perfect. But it's also an ending that it has a massive amount of shock value, Mm -hmm. but also has a massive amount of just just emotional devastation has so much plotting i mean the, the, yeah, it's the, it's the so clever thing. yeah it's clever. it yeah. doesn't it's, all totally tie together it, but it's it's clever i mean that's the thing is is it's one of those jay you and i have said this earlier they just don't make them like this anymore this is mm-hmm. definitely one of no, those this is where what we were like, saying with austin butler because we were sophia yeah smartly said you know austin butler is kind of in the um what did you say so, thumb on the wheeze like who would play yeah, the, like thumb on the wheeze, pit. brad pitt role mm-hmm. and my counter to that was okay but what do they make seven anymore for him to become yeah. a huge movie star? I don't, I, I don't know. They don't make him like they used to. You're right, right? Yeah. And, that, and that's, what's just so perfect about it. And I mean, the movie has this, the cinematography in this movie just has this just nasty, vile, just dirt grimy. under it. It's so grimy. crazy it's watching so... this and then watching dragon tattoo. Yeah. It's so crazy watching this. And then you watch the game. You know that follows after this which i think it's like a movie that is trying to not necessarily rip this off but is trying to get you onto the same feeling and vibe and twisty nature that this thing is and this is doing it not this movie's not trying to do that it that it then surprises you with those as opposed to the game where the contexture of that movie is is essentially to I, it feels like there's twists and turns at every corner and you and sort of, you know, it's very different and it, and it almost feels like an answer to that in, in the worst way. But I don't know. There's just something about seven. I come back to it every single time. I think of Morgan Freeman's narration at the end of it, completely devastating. Just that final shot uh, of the car and just him looking, you know, at Pitt. The world is a good place and, and worth saving. Exactly. I believe the first part. Exactly. It's or the second part. It's incredible, incredible yeah. filmmaking, and it's, and it's one of those that, mm-hmm. yeah, he's the king of the process. And I think with my one and two, this is when the process, this is when both of the processes kind of fail, because the other films like Dragon Tattoo or The Killer, for the most part, like the process ultimately for the protagonist is good at the end. I think that in these two movies, the there's dire consequences to the process and he's so fascinated in talking about that and that's what i think elevates them for me yeah. i just want to say i think some people say that brad pitt is bad at the end of this movie and he's i just want to say those fucking people great. are wrong no no he's, he's so, so good. fucking good in this movie it's ridiculous yeah i love him in this and i think what i love about seven also is that it really like i love the dynamic between somerset and mills between freeman and pitt and how this movie, I think, really smartly expands on this trope that we see in a lot of movies in noir, um, in crime films of this like seasoned detective and a like hot-headed young pup 
And like, as the movie goes on, I love that we don't see John Doe like killing any of these people. We just see the crime scenes. Like that's a very dark and like powerful, surprising thing to do in a film like this, I think too, because seeing the aftermath, seeing the body or hearing about what happened and how he's killing people based on these, the seven deadly sins is just horrifying. And because then I you love... imagine the uh, yeah grossest way that you can imagine them occurring. Yes. Seems... Right. Like with yeah. lust, when you see the weapon, that's all you, you yeah. need to just that's all you need to throw know. up. Yeah. Well, I think that um, that would be, if he did the show, the violence, I think it would be, it would be way too much you even for just it. one or two of the kills even but for him like he's not interested and i don't think no in and that's that. what i like about it it's this it's and it goes really nicely i think with another film that we'll definitely talk about soon but um i also think this movie's funny in a very twisted way specifically very with twisted. um some of Pitt's lines in particular the marquis de chardet is so good i love <laughs> <laughs> love that one um i love the merchant of venice i didn't see it um it's very good but i also one detail i want to point out so there's at the beginning of the movie um at the beginning of gone girl we have an opening shot of amy's head and gwyneth paltrow in this movie when she's laying in bed and you see her blonde mm. head in a very similar way it reminded me of that opening shot and that opening line of course of when i think of my wife i always think of her head um and that's a nice little little connection there between our our hitchcockian or fincher blondes yeah jay what do you love about seven well no uh kevin spacey is very good in it i will say he um, is unfortunately he, yeah unfortunately yeah. um I, I i do think it is one of his weirdly one of his most sensitive movies mm. it is in it it is also one of his darkest movies but the sequences with Morgan Freeman and Gwyneth Paltrow specifically, I think are Incredible so stuff. sweet and, <laughs> and sincere in ways that he doesn't even really try to do most of the time. Um, and that tenderness makes the impact of the final what's in the box scene all the more powerful. And the, the, the balancing act of Morgan Freeman, maybe the like steadiest movie star of all time versus like you were saying, Sophia, this kind of young pup up and coming Brad Pitt trying to prove himself not only in the movie, but in Hollywood, I think made for a just a stellar experience. This is just you'll never forget the first time you see seven. Yeah. And that is important too when you put it in the context of David Fincher's career. I mean, it was almost there was a version of this where Pitt was either going to be played by Stallone or Denzel Washington. And the, on the other side, it was either Robert Duvall, Gene Hackman or Pacino. And it just, I don't know. None of that just seems like a pair that I would like, you know how we go. I just imagine Pacino doing the like, Somerset you kill him. He will win. If <laughs> like you kill him, like a heat voice. he'll win. You know? <laughs> John Dole's got the upper hand. <laughs> Hackman would probably would have been pretty good, but yeah, I, I, you know, but Hackman's could have been good at anything. Uh, no, it just works so well. And I mean, it's really, you know, they, they sort of, it's interesting about the next movie we'll talk about because John Doe was essentially kind of created around the sketch of the Zodiac killer. And, and if that's the next movie we're all going to talk about and, um, and just the, the, just, yeah, I mean, the idea this this movie is so fucking deranged but then yeah jay you're talking about these moments of within the cop procedural that aren't really there right between the partner and the wife and they mean so much and then freeman's reaction to things when he see and like it's the one of the most iconic moments i think in film history um especially the 90s the what's in the box and this and it's such a it's such a gimmick at the, this point but in your, every time you watch it there's real actual emotionality that people kind of forget about because they think of, oh, he's the guy that did Fight Club and what's in the box, right? Like two brutal ideas, but it's actually like, no, that idea of what is in the box is completely just 
horrifying and you you're just melted you feel like pit in that moment and you it's justified and i feel every time when pit pulls that trigger i see i sit there and I go i would do exact same thing but that's exactly the wrong thing to do and it's and it's it so you feel both characters in that moment and that's the brilliance of that screenplay it's the brilliance of fincher's direction the just uh, yeah pit is incredible in this movie He's a movie star, you know, that is just solidifies himself. I think it's that's, you know, why I want them to work together. It was a shame that supposedly I think he was offered the role of of the killer in the killer and he turned it down. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know how I think that he could have done a good job with it. But I think Fassbender, I like Fassbender a lot. I like the change of pace, but I, I feel like I don't know. It's just. It's a damn, damn good movie. It isn't his first movie, but it is one of the all-time calling card announcement movies. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like I'm going to be a superstar from here on out, mm-hmm. and I'm going to leave movies, and I'm going to I'm going to do it all in this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, our number ones. I kind of feel like we all have the same number one. It's like not a no brain. It's a no brainer. We haven't talked about oh, this. Oh, I think we do indeed. I will mute you if you keep this up. The pilot episode of House of Cards <laughs> is my number one. No, it is not. Um, <laughs> I mean, Sophia Zodiac, Jay Zodiac, is that the number mm-hmm. one picture film? Zodiac. Zodiac. What do you love about Zodiac, Sophia? Oh my God, it's how much time do we have? Begin? Where to begin? <laughs> yeah. Um. I, I love it as a portrait of an era and of the mood and of what was happening with the Zodiac killer at the time and how it involves the journalists, the police, the families who are, you know, sitting at their tables trying to solve these riddles and how and that culture of fear that was created. The fact that th- you have to know that this ending can't be tidy in the way that you might expect it because you, we, you know, you don't have the answers to who this killer is. Um, that's so significant. And I think this has some of my favorite scenes really in any movie period, not just in um, Fincher's filmography, but the Lake Berryessa murders, the couple like murdered in broad daylight. I have never seen anything like that in film before. And I think it really is like reading the case files Like there are so many other, you know, victims that the Zodiac killer had that are unknown, right? That we don't know about, but the ones that we do know of because of eyewitnesses or because of the ways that the bodies were discovered, like that to me and the ways that Fincher chooses to stage and show those is it's so, so dark, but so important. And what I also like about it, I mean, there's so, there are so many things and I'm sure you guys will get into them too, but this movie is long because it's it needs to be and the major life events of the characters that we would you know consider to be significant in any other movie we don't see them here because they don't matter in the grand scheme of things when you're thinking about this killer and you're considering that like culture of fear again and the climate that was created by people who became obsessed with this case and in addition to it being a portrait of an era, it's a portrait of obsession. And that's something that's incredibly interesting coming from Fincher, too. So, yeah, I think the ending is so perfect. Again, there isn't any closure, really. And that's what I think makes it brilliant. He leaves things open and ambiguous, just the way that the case was for them at the time. j Dog. No, I agree with everything that Sophia said. I also like it because it has 6,000 amazing character actors in it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if every single person that pops up just has me pumping my fist. Philip Baker Hall. <laughs> just analyzing handwriting. Um, but I mean, it is it is such a tonal masterclass. The ability to maintain this sense of tension and dread for as long as the running time of this movie is is incredible but also when you do imbue it with this true sense of i think this movie is straight up funny yeah like yeah. very funny this movie is mm-hmm. extremely funny and Aqua it is Velva. this oh yeah don't knock it till you try it <laughs> <laughs> it's this balancing act that fincher accomplishes and i think it's partly because 
you know, he grew up around this area during this time. This is in many ways one of his more personal movies. This kind of drove him to have some of the obsessions that he has. And now he's finally kind of confronting it head on. And it is this movie so much about, like you're saying, Sophia, obsession, but also kind of the fleeting um, satisfaction that comes with obsession. Like the obsession Mm -hmm. stays forever, but even anytime you try to crack anything around that obsession those go away and but that obsession sustains and so you have these people who some are so so obsessive and some people just want to cut themselves off from this harrowing experience and it's just so interesting that the guy who is so obsessed comes truly from a a different world he's a crappy political cartoonist and all of a sudden he finds himself caught up in this as much as anybody he is now playing sherlock holmes when he doesn't have the credentials um, and that bleeds into every part of his life, his family, his romantic relationships, his, his, um, his children, his job, his just every single thing eventually becomes consumed by this process. And it is some remarkably well-presented process. And so it's a thoughtful movie. I think it is an emotionally effective movie and it is a freaking movie i mean this thing top to bottom no stone left on will match anything you see in any other thriller like this the the scene at the lake is one of the most terrifying scenes especially when you consider the daytime setting of it it's just Mm -hmm. incredible stuff just sequence for sequence scene by scene it's a masterpiece and then you tie it all together Together in this neat little bow and it even transcends to this next level of greatness it's one of the greatest movies ever ever made straight up yeah um i rewatched it today uh because i saved the best for last i love this movie it's one of my most rewatched movies from a year that i think is a very special year a very formative year for all three of us in 2007 uh a year that you know brings out movies like there will be blood and no country for old men and Michael Clayton, so many movies that we love. And this is definitely up there in terms of its importance for me. And, and I, and I know for y'all as well, it's a Jay, you and Sophia hit it right on the head. This movie about obsession from a man that is obsessed in making the perfect movie, the most meticulous filmmaker that we have, I think working today. And it's a movie about how this obsession leaves you with no questions. I always feel, or, or leaves you with questions. The idea that Fincher who always has the answer in his head for what he wants to do is making a movie about one of the greatest cases ever of unsolved, you know, police work that we've ever had. Is it a movie that is about people that are good at their jobs? I don't, I don't, I mean, they sure are good at their jobs when it's not this case, but it almost feels like it's at times the anti they're good at their jobs, especially the police. Um, in here, and it takes Robert, played by Jake Gyllenhaal, who is giving an absolutely fantastic performance, which Gyllenhaal would do more of these, even though he, I think, reportedly did not like the multiple thousand takes. He's so young um, in this, too. He's so young in this. Ruffalo is super young in it, too, it feels like, and he's incredible. Downey giving just one of his best performances. But then, yeah, I mean, John Carroll Lynn, Dermot Maroney, Brian Cox, Philip Baker Hall, all these character actors also just in a sea full of, of of just being so close and yet so far away from it. And the movie does present itself to of, of from Grace Smith's novel, but as well as also just the evidence. And, and that's what the movie says at the beginning. It's not based on a true story. It's based on case files. That's what this movie is saying. It's that, you know, going from point A to point B, like you're saying, Sophia, it is reading the case files out for the audience. It is giving you who the detectives, Graysmith, everyone thinks did it. But there's no for, there's no 100% truth that this is actually the person that did it. We can only do it based off of social substantial evidence because the handwriting doesn't match either the left or right, which is a big part of the film or you know, or, or various different things, but there's also so much tension in just conversations, that conversation that they have with John Carroll Lynch, where he's, he's twisting his words and his story and it's going up and down and everything. And, and, and 
he just has those shots of all three of the detectives looking there with those stoic faces and and trying to pick up anything that they can to nail this guy while also the moments of violence the mo- the 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 moment for me that isn't the scariest bit of violence isn't the one by the lake though that is truly terrifying it's the scene where the woman is with her baby and she gets picked up by the zodiac killer and he says before i before i kill you i'm going to throw your baby out and then flash to her standing on the side of the road in absolute terror without and a baby. without a baby it's you're you're it brings you back to those moments of seven where you're just it's so helpless and the problem is is that this isn't a a fictitious character this is a real thing that happened and you're right there's all these different events that we don't see but then the second half of the movie becomes grace with obsession the idea of your family your job all of it doesn't matter and you may think you're doing something for the greater good but the world is sort of passed on i mean Toski talks about there's been 200 murders since the last killing of the Zodiac. Nobody and all you care about is this case. And well, that's the prescience of the true crime obsession. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. The, exactly. It's 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 so Fincher had a stranglehold on that way before anybody else did. Exactly. And it's a movie, too, that didn't do well, probably has no business being made. And I'm just so thankful that it is. It it it's it's a like Sophia said, there it's a movie that's supposed to be long because you're supposed to feel the dread that these characters have of a detective. Like it's said in Dragon Tattoo, the guy uh, that uh Blunquist talks about about being his Rebecca case, right? And the idea of that this case has lingered for decades and decades and decades and it's escaped him. And in that film it's solved. This is a giant Rebecca case put on by people that are at, at that are just trying to save everything around them but yet every little detail that we love about these movies is the thing that is getting them further and further away from nailing this son of a bitch and i think that that is such an interesting way of telling the story and yeah the needle drops are, are fucking incredible and the you know the movie looks so dark and and just really you just just look very, ending of hurdy gurdy man needle drop is one of the all-time greats ever yeah mm-hmm. it's completely dark because this is such a dark time for san francisco and everything and yeah i just absolutely love this movie i think i think we all do um how cruel is it that we lost 15 years of this robert downey jr i mean that's yeah. the thing is this is his best performance and then it's oppenheimer like in between it's it's superman movie or superhero movies he's iron man and know? the judge yeah that's right but then also like Hall's in this place where he's not making performances like this i mean ruffalo kind of gets to go back and forth um you know it's it's such an it's it's such a interesting point in in all of it. and i'll say Ang- uh, angus wall's editing in this movie just fast pace it, this movie moves so so confidently and yet it's a movie about not having confidence by the end of all of it like i I love that scene where toski and and gray smith are sitting there and he's got the baby there and he's like i can't tell you everything robert like it's you know it's all those those little things that we sort of love from like pakula movies and things of that uh, from the 70s and yet in those movies it's you know for the most part things turn out okay in this one it's like well everybody doesn't have a job or um or yeah the the book's great but like it's 22 years and he's identifying a photo but does does that mean anything it's on a scale of one to ten it's an eight so it's not a ten so everything's circumstantial and it's yeah that's what's so great about it shout anyway. out to the guy who gets shot in the first scene who played minkus <laughs> on boy meets world well there you go <laughs> oh my god any last things on zodiac guys no it's, it's pretty a great movie. I mean, let's just movie. read the cast list. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I don't think we want to do all that, but it's it's a it's a it's a pretty perfect movie. From is it? Is, I I think I've come to the conclusion that my favorite movie of 2007 is whichever one I watched last of <laughs> Zodiac, No Country, and There Will Be Blood. I, Michael, I think that's where Michael I'm Clayton's at. up there for me because right now it's my favorite one. 
Well, and with mm-hmm. director watch coming up, you're going to have to watch There Will Be I will Blood. Have to rewatch There Will Be Blood and test that theory out. Test yep. that theory out. <laughs> yeah. I think There Will Be Blood. There Will Be Blood is the best, but uh, No Country for Old Men. The ending, I just I love oh, the ending. I love too the much. ending. Yeah, it makes me cry when I think about it. It's I'm telling perfect. you, I, 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 and then I also I watched something like Michael Clayton, and that movie is so rewatchable for me, and it's just, just an absolute. Bang. It's just a, just a banger. That I movie rules. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's four good movies, but there's like dozens others from that year that are, are like incredible. All right, well, we didn't, you know, we we did it. We talked about all the Fincher movies on our list, so we did we we did all our rankings. Yeah. I mean, no Mank. Mm-hmm. Nobody talked about Mank. No Mank. No Mank. Honorable mention. I'm shocked. Better than people give it credit for. No, I like it a lot. It's my I number like seven. It. I love Mank. Um, Killer. We talked about um, Fight Club. So Fight Club. This is my complicated relationship I think with Fight, Fight Club. Club. Is, I think Fight Club is good. I think it's, I think it's good. I just, I, w- I go back to those other ones more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I haven't rewatched it in a long time. I'll revisit it someday. Yeah, I like Norton a lot in it, mm-hmm. and Helen Bottom Carter, Pitt Pitt's performance. I, I go I mean, back Tyler and forth Dur- on Pitt. Burton is just cool. Yeah, I mean, and I love him. Kudos to Fincher for just punching Jared Leto in the face a lot. Mm-hmm. Good for him. He's way again way ahead of his time fincher loves abusing jared leto one of his favorite things to do my favorite things about him yeah it's good for him good on him panic room a little lower love jodie foster and Kristen stewart as a pair that's like really good that's really good casting and it almost didn't happen almost didn't happen love that like i think what is it like nicole kidman's on the nicole kidman yeah she broke a rib i believe yeah um or got hurt during moulin rouge couldn't do it yeah but then I think she's like the white the, on the phone. Like the, when she calls oh, her ex-husband out, she's Nyad? on the phone. You know what I mean? Jody Foster. Foster. Yes, oh Jay, God. of Nyad. That's, Jody's that's so good in it, from. though. Great physical um, actress. Yeah. She was just in that era of making thrillers, and this is mm-hmm. the best one of them. Alien yeah. 3? Good. Good movie. I'm like not Alien. in that camp. I like, I like Alien 3. I don't love it. But I don't think it's like terrible. I don't think he. I, think it's I get good. why he needs to be ashamed of it because of the process and everything. Man's of process, but it's it's not a bad movie. And then the game, which is my least not, favorite. Not my uh, favorite. Not a fan. That's of the my game. that's my last one. Oh, we're yes. all oh we're all on the same page. Least favorite. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. There you go. I gotta rewatch it. I gotta. I, yeah, I we, own it. I own it. You now. own it now. You own it now. Go for I it. I can bought it for this, and you didn't. <laughs> you didn't watch it. What dude. a stupid existence I lead. Truly. All right, but let me ask you one final question. Oh, Jesus Christ. What's your favorite David Fincher TV show? Mindhunter, and I'm moving on. Yeah. Um, I oh, no. I think the minority whip is going to come after you for that one, sir. <laughs> oh, my God. I Jay, do declare. Jay, I hope, your, I hope your employer does not listen to this. Um, Jay. Do you want right. to tell everybody out there where they can find you and all your work? And if you want to, on the way out, tell us your favorite performance from a David Fincher film. Oh, you know the answer to that already, my no, friend. No, I've been playing. I've been, <laughs> I've been moving the chess pieces under the board the whole time. Um, I've been manipulating you to say that this entire episode, oh, and man. I, Frank Underwood. <laughs> I'm finally <laughs> revealing my game. I knew you were going to ask me that the whole, whole time. Jesus um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> favorite Fincher character. Jeez. That's so hard. Yeah. I don't know. You want to give us your, give us your Baker shoulders? Hall is the handwriting expert in uh, Zodiac. Obviously. There you go. There you go, buddy. All right. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Mr. J Ledbetter Letterbox. Just look for J Ledbetter. Um, and go see Nyad starring <laughs> Jody Foster. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, where can we find you in your favorite picture performance? God damn it. Oh, my God. Well, <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at Sophia underscore Sim letterbox same handle without the underscore you can find my podcast oscar wilde at oscar wilde pod and you can find all of my work including reviews and interviews at awards watch and 
on that topic, I mean, favorite Fincher performance, I have to say, Rosamund Pike as Amy Dunn in Gone Girl. Um, I think that one, that's like my easy favorite. But then like, I love Amanda Seyfried in Mank. Oh, um, I think she's really wonderful. And I'm so happy that she got nominated. Um, I'm also going to say Madonna in the Express Yourself music video because perfection. Um, I love that video. You can see his love of old Hollywood glamour. Such an interesting way to start your career. So I would also include include that. Okay. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterbox at Ryan McQuaid 77. Uh, you can find all my work here at awardswatch.com. You like the chaos of this episode uh you should definitely listen to jay and myself over at director watch we're doing a paul the thing Thomas- you are failing to understand ryan oh, is there's far less chaos than you think i have <laughs> this fully under control all right um we're doing a paul thomas anderson series right now actually next with this week's episode will include all three of us here minus the incredibly problematic frank underwood let um, me be frank about one thing and one thing only sir <laughs> you you may be the figurehead of this organization but you are not in charge you are not in charge and you never have been sir we'll be talking about boogie nights this week and it will it will probably be as chaotic as you think it is um and while you're over on itunes and spotify I pray to God that you give us five stars after this episode. Uh, also, give us a review. We'd greatly appreciate it. Over over on the website, also, please go and sign up for the newsletter. Eric releases those at least twice a week. That is the best way to get all of our podcasts, all of our reviews, all of our interviews that we'll be doing. We're going to be doing a ton of interviews as uh, the uh, SAG strike has just ended, and then there we'll be able to um, talk to a lot of of the best people that have given performances or, you know, behind the scenes stuff this year, my favorite performance in a David Fincher film. I mean, Ooh, um, I mean, Pitt and Benjamin buttons really great. Uh, I do love Rudy Mara. Affleck and Pike are extraordinary and gone girl Freeman and seven. I think my actual answer is Robert Downey Jr. In Zodiac. He's really great. Jillian Hall in I know that'll make Eric very happy. Jillian Hall in Zodiac is great. But I think even though I said that a different actor was the MVP, I think Andrew Garfield in, in Social Network is just the right answer. He's extraordinary in that and I like that standing next to you, Sean. You make me look so tough. That scene he's where he's like snubbed at the Oscars. That scene where he's talking about his diluted shares is just heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. How many above the line Oscars have David Fincher movies won? Have he's has he won? Yeah. None. None? No, no wait, one. Oh, wait. One. Oh, yeah. Sorkin won screenplay, so I guess that's above the line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh and that's it, I think. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, unless I'm missing something, but I don't He's been nominated well, twice for director. I mean, cinematography is technically not below the line, and Mank won for that. Is that no? That's below the line. Well, there's a. It de- it depends who you who you talk to. It's a technical, but above the line, below oh. the line, there's children. Children, no need to <laughs> fight. I, I think it's below. We will get through this together. We are on um, the same team. Uh, I think of the screenplays, the actors, the director, and picture. That's what I think is above the line. Um, okay, you know, but but I mean, if 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 you wanted to include that, then yeah, um, he won for for Mank, which I, I know most people don't like that win, right? Um, mm-hmm. uh, I, I don't love that win. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Social Network didn't win that. I don't believe did Mm-mm. it. No, so. Um, but then like, yeah, Mara and Pike and Eisenberg are the only, oh no. And Pitt, I guess Pitt too, or, or for Ben Button. Those are his four acting nominations, right? Cause Blanchett didn't get in for Ben Button. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's his Oscar well, I'll tell you this, this thing's getting nominated for nothing. Which killer. one? The killer? Oh, you didn't think, you think so? I mean, it might get a, a couple tech Techs, noms or something. Maybe a tech? Okay. Yeah, no. Also, I, I was wrong. I was thinking of something different. It's cinematography can be below the line. They're just on the, you know, 
with the director. They're like oh, known as their first hand. That's why oh, I always okay. think of it oh, that way. Okay. This is what a democracy is all about. <laughs> Jesus. I think uh I think sound would be great for the killer. That would be mm-hmm. a wonderful That would be my preferred win. Yeah. For sure. Fortunately, everybody's or no. watching it at home. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. the killer is totally antithetical to a Netflix movie because it is about boredom. Yeah. <laughs> And so what's the worst thing you could do is Netflix and chill. Have your phone next to you. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So, well, can't wait to talk about the next Fincher film when it comes out. Maybe we'll read, maybe which Marvel movie do you think he should make? Oh, uh, none, because that would be a disastrous move. So with that, Mm -hmm. thank you all so much for listening and we'll see you all next week where we'll be talking about, uh, the best and worst prequels of all time. Thanks so much. Bye.